And Chris Thielen is our host today. And I'm just going to let Chris introduce himself and do his thing. All right. Well, thank you, Maggie. Uh, this is Chris Thielen. Hello. I'm uh, here in Syracuse. I'm a Howard Hanna branch manager for our Cicero North Syracuse office. I also do some teaching for the state, um, the licensing class, um, when we used to do it in person. Um, and uh, I've been in the business about 22 years. So I appreciate everyone taking the time to see me this morning and join me here. We're gonna do uh, about an hour and a half together. We're gonna, the subject matter is uh, itself is fair housing. And I'm, I've got a PowerPoint that I'm gonna pull up in a moment, but let me begin by sharing my screen. And I'm gonna show you a couple of things before we jump into the, let's see here. Okay, can everyone see this where it says 25 undercover, undercover testers trained? Excellent. So what I've just pulled up is a, um, uh, a three-year study about the residential real estate industry specifically in Long Island. And Newsday, which is a periodical, a publication, uh, spent three years doing an undercover investigation of our industry as it relates to fair housing. This was in released in, I would say, about 14 months ago. And it really has changed uh, our industry both on a state and national level. 2021 will be the year of fair housing. Um, had it not been for COVID, 2020 would have been. And in large measure due to this, to this, uh, this article, <clears throat> and it was, it's, um, I encourage all of you to go to uh, projects.newsday.com and, and review this on your, on your own time. Um, let me scroll down to just, and why I say it was a game changer is it put into perspective the reality of what it was taking place, at least on Long Island, relative to the subject. So 25 undercover testers were trained. And by the way, they used um, <clears throat> both college professors as well as uh, uh, civil rights attorneys to put this program together. So you had very serious and professional journalists, but also attorneys and professors that organized this and put it together. And here's what their findings were. 93 real estate agents were tested. 240 hours of meetings were secretly recorded. So they had hidden cameras on them. 5,763 um, house listings were analyzed, and it was a three-year Newsday investigation undercovered widespread evidence of unequal treatment by real estate agents on Long Island. It found that 19% of the time uh, there were violations against Asian Americans. With Hispanics, it was 39% of the time and 49% of the time with blacks. So if you can imagine, literally just about 50%, one out of two times uh, with African-Americans, there was uh, discrimination identified with the hidden cameras. So you can imagine, it's really put a new perspective uh, on the fact that these are not old issues. They're very current and with us today, right? So with that said, let me So our class objectives today, discuss the benefits of fair housing and consistent procedures. Uh, we begin with that bullet point because if you implement consistent procedures into your routine and how you go about your business, uh, you won't have the 
um, opportunity to make a mistake. Get in the habit of doing everything very rote. Uh, if I work with uh, family members who I obviously know intimately, I, I do the exact same thing with them that I do with complete strangers, simply to make sure that I'm being consistent in the procedures and how I go about my business. We're also gonna discuss ad creation, making sure that we know how to do that and that it is inclusive. And we're gonna have some um, discussion about what would you do in certain instances. So what is fair housing? Fair housing means that everyone has the right to live wherever he or she wants to live and can afford to live. So can you afford it? If you can afford it, you have every right to live there. <clears throat> in 2019, there was something else that happened, uh, kind of coincided with the Newsday article. It was the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. Um, and NAR he did a huge celebration of look at how far we came. And oh, geez, a couple months later, that article came out. Um, in turn, what NAR has done uh, in, in reaction to the Newsday article, one of the things that they've done, is they've put together a, a, a video, an interactive um, lesson that you can do on their website. So I also encourage you guys not only to visit the Newsday article, but to, to, vis uh, to visit Fair, uh, Fairhaven on the NAR website. And I believe that's what was put up earlier. Um, so it's a fair housing class that you can take. Um, and I really encourage you to do that as well. So fair housing laws, what do they prohibit? The refusal to show, sell or rent a property, uh, differing treatment from person to person, panic selling or block busting, uh, which is convincing people to sell because of fear or um, convincing people to move uh, either into a specific neighborhood or away from a neighborhood based upon what's transpiring there. Uh, steering, steering would be saying, hey, I think you'd be happy in this location. Discriminatory advertising or statements and threats or interference with a person's fair housing rights. So um, I'm gonna have uh, you guys, if you don't mind at any time throughout the course of this, by the way, I should have began with this, um, unmute yourself, uh, let's make this interactive rather than a lecture or you'll be very bored. Um, and I'm gonna ask a, a, an open-ended question right now. Um, who wants to take a stab at what some of the protected classes are on a federal level? Um, not the New York state, but specific to the federal level. Anyone have ideas on what are some protected classes? Who are my brave people that are gonna talk early this morning? I would say color, color people maybe. Okay, okay, people of color? You know, yes. Uh, ethne ethne uh, different ethnicity from okay. different countries. Okay. Uh, perhaps national origin, right. where folks are from. Others? Military, um, maybe military. Military? Okay. Not on the federal level, but you're you're correct. Uh, on a state level. So this next slide tells us on the federal level. The protected classes are as follows, and there's seven of them. Race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, and national origin. So uh, any questions on any what any one of those really mean? So familial status, is it is it a is it a single person? Is it a single person with children? Is it a household that has children? That would be familial status. The composition of who might live in a residence does not matter, okay? Now there might be some local zoning laws. I live near Syracuse University and they have zoning laws about how many college kids can live in one building based on code and what's safe, right? What if the house were to have a fire? You can't have 30 people living in a, in a, in a two bedroom place as an example. But aside from local safety code, uh, the composition of the folks in the household really does not matter. So that's the protected classes. In New York State, we also have additional protected classes. And remember, anytime you have a federal law, it applies to each and every state. So while these are federally protected classes, 
they are protected classes, therefore, in New York State. But New York State has gone above and beyond what the federal law has and has uh, some <clears throat> and has uh, uh, protected classes as well. So easy to remember. Now, I'm confused by this slide every time I show it because RCR SDFN is not necessarily an acronym that spells anything out. <laughs> so you might as well just remember race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, and national origin. Unlike old car, which we remember from the licensing class, right? Which spells old car. Okay, now this slideshow came from our counterparts in Michigan where they have additional protected classes. Let me tell you about in New York State. In New York State, we do have age, we do have marital status, but um, is it Jens or Jens? Yes, Jens. Mm -hmm. Jens. So as Jens pointed out, military status in New York is also a protected class. Um, military status, sexual orientation is a protected class. Very newly, uh, gender identity became a protected class. And also very newly, uh, source of income became a protected class. Um, what do you suppose, because we said a moment ago, every American has a right to live wherever they choose to live and can afford to live. What do we mean therefore by source of income? What do you guys suppose? I was just gonna ask what, what you meant by source of income. Right, okay. So source of income means if, if you are receiving your money in a legal manner, okay, then your money is green, so to speak, and you may live wherever you choose to. <clears throat> Why that has been implemented in New York State is um, it, it, it's a reaction to the rental market primarily where people might get Section 8 vouchers, which are uh, subsidized money in order to rent, okay? So it's, it's for lower income folks that need assistance with their living arrangements, right? And they get Section 8 housing. It's a financial voucher for them to be able to rent properties. Up until about maybe a year, year and a half ago, landlords were able to say, I will not take Section 8 housing which always baffled me because it was assured money because it came from the government and those checks never bounce, right? But uh, landlords uh, would not take it. And now in New York state, they must. So start your career with good practices, be consistent. Um, and I wanna drill down on that because that's what the very first bullet point on the very first slide said. So what do we mean by being consistent? I'll use um, your office as an example. Let's say you're working at the office and uh, throughout the course of your working there in any given week, uh, consumers might come in and might cold call. Just, you know, we've got storefronts for a reason, right? They come in and they start to, um, they start to interact with you. And let's say the first person that comes in is um, uh, a buyer. Let's say, in, in fact, in all instances uh, that given week, everybody's a buyer. Um, the first day, however, you have an appointment to get to. So you're feeling anxious, you're feeling rushed. You, you interact with that person, but you're very quick about it. And then the next day someone comes in and says, um, they're also interested in buying. You start to work with them, but you have all the time in the world because you have no set appointments. And you say, hey, can I get you a cup of coffee? Come on in. You start to interact with them in a very different manner because you have all the time in the world. That alone would be a violation or could potentially be a violation. If in fact it's identified that you, um, with person number one, if they were a protected class, because it could easily be perceived as though you were giving uh, less attention to that person that is from a protected class than you were the person um, on day two. Does that make sense? Sean, I see your hand. Um, what about rescheduling the appointment? You know, explain the situation. Does that protect you from? It, 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 it certainly, it's a, that's a great question and it's a great way to problem solve, right? So I, I love that. Um, <clears throat> what I would encourage is immediately explain yourself and say how, and then go into, however, my, my time is yours and I want to afford you all the time that you need. I've got, you know, just about 10 minutes here right now. Um, 
let's let's begin. And could we set an appointment uh, for tomorrow when I know I'm completely free? And I would love to do that with you right now up front. Let's create a time that will work for one another. How does that sound? And you get their buy-in. In fact, Shauna, the I think anytime something of on on this whole subject matter of fair housing comes up, the best thing to do is if there's an elephant in the room, immediately address it. So quite often I'll have agents say to me, "My goodness, my I, you know I'm talking to someone and they asked me uh, a, a question that I was really comfortable with. How do I how should I respond?" And it might be innocuous. Uh, it might ha not have come from a place. The question itself might not have come from a place of um, malice, but it still might flirt or skirt around fair housing. And therefore, what I suggest agents do is say, I get that question quite often. However, due to fair housing laws, I can't address that. I can imagine that um, you would understand why. So a typical question that would be uh, uh, along those lines might be, hey, Chris, um, I'm from out of town. Where's a safe area? Um, we don't want to start interpreting what areas are safe, right? That can fall, that could be, you know, that's a um, more than a slippery slope. It's something that we can't do. So there's an old saying, don't be the source, rather be the source of the source. So when asked, Chris, what's a safe area? I simply say, I do get that question a fair amount. I understand why you would ask it. It's reasonable, right, for you to wonder as from being out of town and areas and, and safety and so, and so on. However, due to fair housing laws, it's just an issue that I and a question that I cannot address by law. People understand that we have rules and they understand that we can't break them. And in fact, the agent that are, identifies it right up front, what do they end up doing? Well, I think gaining, gaining the respect of the person because we're rule followers. You certainly gain their confidence that you're gonna do well by them, that you do things the right way. Right. So um, identifying and saying because of fair housing laws, I, I cannot address that. But here's what I would suggest. You know, we have a multitude of governing agencies. I'm going to encourage you to uh, to do your own research uh, by reaching out to um, either your local uh, sheriff's department, uh, any local law enforcement of any of the areas that you're looking into and make it determine for yourself what is the best place for you. And of course, I'll show you any and all properties within the places that you ask of me. Right, does so it make sense? So you take the porcupine off your back and you put it right on theirs. And you are the source of the source. Here are some places you could go to identify um, uh, areas that you deem to be safe. Same thing with schools. People ask all the time, what are the best schools? Well, I'll use, uh, I'll use I've, got, I've got a son, I'll use him as an example. He plays a lot of lacrosse. So in a lot of people's minds, the best lacrosse school historically in my area is a place called West Jenny. So I might interpret it as a lacrosse dad, hey, West Jenny is the best school system. Ironically, I don't live there, um, but that might be a perception that someone has. But I might not be talking to someone who has a lacrosse kid, right? So what is, what is a good school system to one person may not be to the next person. And therefore with safety, with schools, we do not wanna get into interpretation whatsoever. We also need to educate sellers and landlords maintain good records and promote free choice. So how do we educate sellers and landlords? Basically, we have the discussion. What, um, and we kind of just ran through that. Identify right up front the rules that you have to follow so that they don't feel as though you're, um, uh, if, you don't, if you don't articulate why you're being the source of the source, if you don't articulate why you can't speak towards a subject matter, you're probably gonna get some consternation. So just talk about that elephant right up front. And as we said, promote free choice. Okay, listing procedures. Express a commitment to upholding fair housing. Review fair housing with the seller. Obtain seller's written commitment to abide by the law. And how do we do this in writing? Well, really two ways. Up until June 20th of this year, we would do it with what's called an equal opportunity form. Equal opportunity form. And that's still out there. And that's still one of the forms that you're going to be utilizing when working with people. Now, who recalls what the very first document the state of New York says we always have to fill out? What's the very first? And it says right across the top, this is not a contract. I'm going to wait. Someone's got to tell me. <laughs> Come on, guys. 
First substantive contact. What do we do at first substantive contact? What's the document? The New York State um, Agency Disclosure Agency form. Disclosure? Yeah. Yes, correct. Thank you. So the New York State Agency Disclosure Form must be done at first substantive contact. Okay. Well, at that very moment in time, and this is prior to June 20th of 2020, uh, I always encouraged agents to also do the equal opportunity document as well. Let's just get it out of the way so that we don't forget about it. However, on June 20th, New York State came out with a brand new law and a brand new document. So I would like to show that to you. Bear with me. Where are we here? Let's see if this will bring it up. That is not it. I have so many different things opened up. No, okay, I'm gonna switch gears on you and I will find that in a second, but since I found something else that I wanted to share with you, it coincides with this new law on 20, um, June 20th of 2020. So let's talk about what happened that day and then I'll, I'll, I'll share a few more things with you. So things moving forward as of June 20th. The first is putting out at also first substantive contact, the first time we interact with someone, the New York State Fair Housing Discrimination Disclosure Form. That's what I was just seeking and I do have it. I just don't wanna keep you guys waiting. I'll pull it up in a moment. So this is the uh, fair housing document. Do this document when you do your New York State agency disclosure, do the fair housing disclosure. It's two pages and in summary, what it is saying is, it's identifying that New York State has discrimination laws, that we're involved in fair housing and equal um, opportunity. It talks in terms of what real estate brokers may and more importantly may not do. So we may not discriminate. We, um, we can't negotiate discriminatory terms. We can't discriminate based on any uh, protected classes. We cannot steer, we cannot do blockbusting. Um, and so on. And then it goes on to say, if this were to happen to you, the consumer, here are the resources that you can turn to, to file a complaint. And you can do so with the uh, Division of Human Rights um, and um, with New York State um, Department of State. And they list how you can contact those organizations. On page two, it identifies the party. Are you a buyer or a seller? And it asks you to sign. You're gonna give a copy of that and you are going to retain a copy of that. And here's something you wanna make sure it does not happen. The date on that document should never be the date of say your purchase offer because it is exceptionally rare that someone buys a house on the first day they meet their agent, right? Every once in a blue moon that might happen, maybe at an open house and they walk in and say, I've got to write an offer right now. But if there was ever uh, uh, an issue that arose, or oftentimes I, um, New York State will audit and take a look at records just to make sure we as an industry are doing things properly, um, they're going to look to make sure that you have this discrimination disclosure form. And if it has the exact same date as your purchase offer, they're going to say, geez, how long were you working with this person? And how long were you working with this person under terms where you did not follow the law, which was to express and um, uh, equal opportunity rules and fair housing rules. And you were supposed to do that when you first began working with this person. It's, a, it's an easy way to get yourself in trouble. And agents being very busy oftentimes will say, oh my gosh, I know I have to hand in all my paperwork. I forgot to do it. Please here, sign this along with the purchase offer, right? You don't want to have that happen to yourself. Now, why do I have this pulled up? This is my Facebook page for business. And another thing that they said on June 20th was 
any any advertising that any real estate broker, associate broker, uh, real estate agent, and or team, any any advertising that they do, must have the link to the New York State Fair Housing Notice in what they call above the fold. So here's my F Facebook page opened up. And at the very bottom of the page, this is considered the fold. The fold is where you would have to go to scroll down. It's an old term used in advertising from back when newspapers were much more popular. Newspapers are folded in half. It's above the fold. And New York State says you must have the fair housing link above the fold anytime you do advertising. And what is Facebook or in all social media considered? It is considered advertising. So I've got another Facebook page and it's simply Chris Thielen because I don't call myself Christopher, only New York State and my mom does. But I have to use my licensed name whenever I conduct business. So that's why this is the Christopher E. Thielen page. And because I put things relative to real estate on this page, I therefore have to have this link above the fold. So I'm gonna have you guys make sure that you do that on your own social media pages, not just Facebook, but all platforms that you might use. Does that make sense? Is there any questions on that? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so when you run like advertisements, like the like a, like just a Facebook or Instagram ad, it pops up like there's the picture and then there's the caption under it. Mm -hmm. If you put, would you have to put the, um, the fair housing thing in the link to the, like under the picture, like, or would it not really matter because they would just click on your profile and then they would see it on your profile or would you have to keep it on the picture or anything like that? It's, bo uh, it's both a great question as well as a very intuitive um, uh, way of putting it because you're spot on on the way to to address it. So uh, what what the state said was, we, we the state understand that not every web page has a field, a place to put, to put this link, okay? Um, so realtor.com and Zillow, I'll use those two as an example. Realtor.com, when you go in to create your agent profile, um, you know, has, you know, places pre predetermined fields that you fill in, you know, uh, your address, your business phone number, uh, your name, et cetera. Uh, Zillow does as well, but neither, and I don't recall off the top of my head, uh, neither uh, may have necessarily the space for that link. But there's typically always a link somewhere to be able to put it to your business, your, your actual Howard Hanna uh, page. And therefore, having to your point, if you have links, if there is no space, but there is a link that will bring you to, um, to uh, either your Facebook and or your Howard Hanna page, somewhere where you do demonstrate that, you will be okay because New York State was reasonable enough to say not every place will have that field. Um, so I hope I hope I articulated that well enough. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. So therefore, in an advertisement, if there's no space for it, but the link brings you to uh, 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 in the there's a link to more information about that house. Typically, that's going to be more to see more information about this house. Click here. They do. They are brought to the Howard Hanna page, and Howard Hanna is in compliance. Okay, so, so that's how it's done. Guess what right now in New York State, the most violated law is relative to our industry. Uh, I, I don't have this um, uh, for sure, but I believe it to be true. It's anecdotal at this moment in time. Um, I'm gonna be at the NYSAR meetings. They're going on right now. And I'm gonna talk to a guy named Anthony Gatto who is an attorney for New York State Real Estate for our trade association, because uh, I'm sure he's going to tell me that this, by not having this, this is probably the number one, viol no, one number one most violated law that agents are doing right now. Um, very few are doing it. And in Syracuse, we've really, uh, we, we kind of noticed that we, we all got a little distracted with COVID, as you can imagine, as has the state. So they've not really cracked down on this, but um, uh, it's inevitable that they will. Because what's going on with New York State right now? They are... Um, they're in need of money, right? So um, we do know, and it's been articulated to us that there, um, there a great deal more money has been uh, allocated to the people that test our industry. Um, so, uh, 
So make sure that you put this into your into your social media, this link into your social media, and tell your real estate friends, you know, politely, hey, I just did this. You might want it as well. Chris, you took the words right out of my mouth because I've seen nobody with that fair housing notice. I have been searching other people at Howard Hanna um, um, from my area, and I've not seen anyone with that. So you really just took the words right out of my mouth because I was very surprised to see that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Doris. And, and uh, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, we have not done a great job messaging it. So in Syracuse, I'll take ownership of that because I was doing board work this past couple of years. Um, but we've, uh, since this rule came out, we have done two broker owner meetings where we have told every broker owner, make sure your agents are doing this. And then it's up to the broker to, to have their agents do it. Um, but that's a heavy lift. You know, you know, there's 1,700 agents just in my local board of realtors. So that's a lot of people to make sure that they're up and running and doing it properly. So it's, you know, unfortunately, it's taking some time, but you're, you're correct, Doris. It's, 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 it's an issue. It's an issue. Um, the other reason agents might not want to do it is they either don't know and or they want to put something else in that space. Right. So we just saw my Facebook page and they might want to they might want to put, you know, um, buy and sell with me. I'm the, you know, cat's meow. Um, they believe it might cost them business. Shame on them. If they're not if they're, if that is the cause and reason for them to do it uh, on Facebook, you have nothing but um, openness to write anything you want each and every day. So I really encourage you guys make sure that you're that you're in compliance with that. I am going to go back to sharing my screen and our PowerPoint. Go back to where we left off. Okay. So listing procedures. We said express a commitment, review fair housings with the seller, obtain seller's written commitment to abide by the law. We know that's through our historically our equal opportunity document. Um, disclosure, uh, you're still going to be using that because it has other language on there as well about, about um, escrow monies, et cetera. But also you're going to now do the New York State Housing Discrimination Disclosure Form. And I'm sorry that I wasn't able to find that, but it's in every one of your offices. You'll find it wherever you keep your forms. It's uh, in Syracuse. I'm positive that it's in what we call, um, it's in our MLS and in our Instanet forms. Um, and, I, and I'm certain that therefore it would be true for, if it is for Syracuse, it is for Rochester and Buffalo. We all share the same system and I'm sure it is for the rest of the MLSs around the state as well. So we make sure that it's in writing. Okay, fair housing and advertising. The Fair Housing Act prohibits the making, printing or publishing of any statement, notice or advertisement in connection with the sale or rental of housing that expresses a preference limitation or discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, or national origin. So how does someone make sure that they themselves uh, abide by that last slide, abide by that rule? If you describe the property, you will always be safe. If you describe the property, you will always be safe you'll never have a problem. But you may not describe the buyer, the seller, the owner, the neighbors. You don't wanna describe even necessarily the neighborhood. Another thing that we see quite often that should not be done, um, it's a very slippery slope, would be award-winning schools. Um, now, if it's a statement of fact and that school won an award, you're probably not gonna have someone knocking on your door saying that it's a violation. But here's what they will do. And I have this directly from Mary Lee Weatherall, who was the tester and ran the organization in central New York for the Department of State. <clears throat> if I'm saying that uh, such and such a school has is award-winning and I'm selling the attributes of that school and I'm referencing schools, I better reference in all of my other advertising schools as well, regardless of the school itself or whether they had an award. Remember, on the very first slide, we talked about consistency. So if I address schools, then I'm going to have in one instance and in one location, I'm going to have to do it in all. Um, therefore, don't bring them up. Don't put them into your advertising. Don't describe the 
neighbors and also really the neighborhood. Now, let's say it's near a park, near shopping, near highways, that would be okay, okay? Any questions on that? So we've got some ideas or some examples, I should say, of discriminatory language. Bachelor pad, uh, great for single or empty nesters. In the heart of Little Italy or walk to a synagogue. Are any of these okay? Are they all bad? Are they all, what do you guys think? I, mean, uh, I looked at it when I was new. I'm sorry, Logan, you were gonna say oh, something? Sorry, uh, no. they're all not, uh, not good. Yeah, they're, no, they're all not good, exactly right. So, and yet you would think, um, you know, walk to synagogue would be actually a feature and attribute that someone really might want uh, to take advantage of. But because it's speaking towards religion, it's actually not okay. Uh, we have uh, areas of towns in most cities, uh, Chinatown or Little Italy's, right? Um, uh, I lived in Washington, D.C. Chinatown has these huge gates saying Chinatown in huge banners. It's a permanent structure and it's as big as a building. Uh, the community calls it that, but we in our industry may not, okay? And obviously bachelor pad speaks towards what? Familial status. So does great for singles or empty nesters, right? Uh, uh, it's gotten to where even language like um, um, master suite has been used forever and a day. Maybe owner suite would be better language, right? It speaks towards the owner it's the, or the primary bedroom. So be very mindful of the language that you use. So examples of non-discriminatory language, one bedroom, that's okay. Cottage, one bedroom cottage in a convenient neighborhood, all okay. We're describing the property. We're describing the location. We're not describing the location in a, way, in a manner that would be possibly questionable because we haven't brought into schools and we haven't brought in uh, places of worship. Nearby a walking path through a great park. So there's things that we can say, there's things that we can't we cannot say, there's some things that might be fuzzy. And if you're fuzzy on whether or not you can say it, do one of two things, err on the side of caution and or make sure that you talk to your manager and they'll help you navigate through that, okay? Okay. Why create the paper trail? Why create the paper trail? Documentation provides a defense against claims. <clears throat> So I'm gonna pause here. And what I'm gonna encourage all of you to do is to create a safe harbor for yourself. And what is a safe harbor? It's a legal term for the more due diligence that you do preemptively, if, if an unfortunate situation arises, um, presumably none of us, right, are going to break the law or break the law knowingly or purposefully. So, um, but I'm gonna share an example of, with you of something that happened to a friend of mine in this industry. Um, I've known him for 20 years. His name is Pete. Pete tells this story, so I'm not speaking out of school. But a couple of, uh, about 15 years ago, Pete was working with a, with a buyer client. And um, one day that buyer client called his broker, a woman named Mary, said, Mary, we want to file a complaint. Pete, Pete's discriminated against us. And Mary did a great job because Mary said, Rather than getting defensive, she said, oh my goodness, that is terrible. Please tell me, tell me more, what transpired? And she listened. And she listened and she digested what they were saying and she absolutely understood um, their consternation. But then she was able to reply and say, you know, I think really what we have is a communication breakdown or a misinterpretation of intent and meaning by Pete. Because Pete, you might not know this, but his father escaped the Holocaust and Pete himself is Jewish. In other words, the folks that felt uh, slighted, they themselves were Jewish and they did not know that Pete himself was as well. They shared this in common. And, um, and once it was explained to them, they were, as consumers were completely okay. But that's a very pro uh, scary proposition for any of us. When we're dealing with the general public, you know, things can be misinterpreted. And that's what happened to Pete. So Pete had a safe harbor, so to speak, or one component in his safe harbor. And that was the fact that he shared the same faith. 
you might want to create your own safe harbor. And the more continuing education that you do, for instance, this class itself, keep documentation of having done it. We mentioned Fair Haven. The NAR provided um, uh, interactive uh, uh, web-based uh, education tool that you guys can do. It takes about an hour, an hour and a half. Go ahead and do that. In fact, you might want to do that once a year. In case someone ever are, um, accidentally misinterprets something that you do and or say, you can say, my goodness, I've at least tried my hardest to be, to be mindful of this subject matter. And I've on my own accord gone above and beyond the bare minimum requirements that the state makes me do relative to continuing education on the subject matter of fair housing, right? So create yourself a fair uh, safe harbor, uh, take as much uh, continuing it on your own accord, keep documentation that you've done so. So it's a good business practice. It makes a sales associate a problem solver uh, by documenting things. It saves a sales associate time, right? You're not scrambling. If you can create very distinct habits and document everything and do it time and time again, you will get into the habit um, of being very efficient. And um, activities are recorded for reference. Information is readily available. In other words, create a system. What is your system? Figure out a system for yourself. I have in my car, the New York State Agency Disclosure Form, and the New York State Discrimination Disclosure Form. You know, six months ago, I only had the um, agency disclosure. I've got now copies of both in my car because I never know when I might stumble into the opportunity to interact with the consumer. And then there's another thing that I keep in my car right now as well, and that's the COVID documents about one's health, the questionnaire for the consumer. All three of those documents are in my car 24 seven so that I never find myself last minute racing out to an appointment only to find that I don't have it, okay? So create a system for yourself. All right, we're not gonna run through these scenarios and that is it for this slideshow. Give me another moment. Let's see, it's 9.43. Give me another moment here. Any questions on what we've covered so far? Cheryl, is it Cheryl? Cheryl, hi. Yes, hi. Um, my question goes back a little bit um, and I typed it in the chat. Um, as far as posting the um, fair housing notice, does that, I, I would assume it carries over to printed advertising as well. Um, how extensively on printed advertising does it go? Like, I, I was wondering, like I was thinking about ordering my own stationery to send out to people. Does it need to be everywhere above the fold or how extensive is the rule? Great question. Um, so it's one, it's untested. It's such a new rule, it's untested. There's the language itself uh, provided to us by New York State is very pointed and specific. I don't have it in front of me, um, uh, <clears throat> but uh, they, they, they were very mindful when they crafted the language, but it, it, it does not speak to every last case scenario. But if my thought would be this, if you're gonna create your own stationary, right? Stationary might be something that, you know, the language, the, the term stationary is simply, you know, letters with my name and address on it, et cetera. If I'm going to use that stationary in personal life, clearly I don't need it. But if I'm going to be utilizing it for business, maybe thank you notes, for every one of my customers that I send out after the transaction, right? I, I probably gonna want it on there. Um, would New York State interpret that as, as a form of advertisement? Well, certainly if I were to send out um, postcards or handwritten letters canvassing a neighborhood, that is advertisement, right? And that, if you're gonna use your stationery for it, put it on there. So my suggestion would be, if it, I think if it were on the stationery itself, which might be just an, um, let's say it was an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that you write um, notes on. Well, I would have it probably at the bottom. I don't know that they would necessarily say, geez, it's gotta be above the fold because that's not what we do with stationary. Um, so are there any other questions? Okay. I'm gonna ask that you bear with me a second. In fact, so that I can pull some stuff up why don't we take uh, about a three to five minute break?
All right, so everybody be back a couple minutes um, by 9.50. That'd be great, thank you. Maggie, I get a quick question. Yep. Um, so, so what I've been doing the last three times or so that we've I've taught for you, um, I've followed this up with the uh, law of agency. So I've done fair housing and agency. Was agency wasn't something that someone else was covering in this series of classes, correct? It'll be covered again regionally at the very end. Um, so they will, but it's never. It, Agencies is the thing that they're most likely to get in trouble over. We can't do it too much. <laughs> okay. Okay. I was going to say. So I've got I've got some other stuff that I could do, but it was not with PowerPoint. Um, I'll do what I've been doing all along, which is is agency. I just wanted to confirm that that's. Yeah, I mean there is an agency thing. Yeah, if there's something you think is more pertinent, they will get agency again. Okay. So it's it, you know, uh, I I leave it to your better judgment. Okay. I trust you. Okay. I know I know Jen does. Okay. I'm going to add a link here. Um, it's fair housing from the Fair Housing Institute, and it's the guidelines to compliance. Okay, great. Fair housing. It's 950. So whenever you're ready. Okay. I'm about to begin. I see a lot of black boxes. Um, I'd imagine people are just going to start joining us again, but I will get us going. Um, so uh, I did find the document I had been looking for earlier. Let me share that. So this is the document that came out on June 20th of 2020, the New York State Housing and Anti-Discrimination Disclosure Form. This must be done um, in essence at first substantive contact, just like New York State Agency Disclosure must. And as you can see, it talks in terms of, uh, there's a preamble at, um, identifying the, um, the various protected classes. It gives some examples here, uh, along here of uh, things that real estate agents may not do. It talks in terms of the consumer having the right to place a complaint and where they may do that, either through the Department of State or the Division of Human uh, Rights. And then it identifies the parties to the, uh, to the um, interaction. So you would put your name, uh, the name Howard Hanna, and then you would have the buyer's name and or seller, tenant, landlord, et cetera, the consumer's name here. They would then circle what role they are, they would sign and they would date. 
Make sure this date here is from when you first interact with the people, not from when you write the purchase offer, okay? All right, next up, Okay, so we've talked about fair housing, and now what I wanna talk about is a, a similar subject matter, and that is basically risk reduction. So there's different types of knowledge. Um, do you know the difference between education and training? Today, you're getting training. This is specific to training. The information you take away from this would be the education itself, and therefore, you're gonna to want to implement the things that you've learned today. So you get trained, that becomes education, and then you implement the education in your daily life. And the number one thing that we're trying to communicate and articulate right now is have systems and make sure you're consistent. Have those systems in place will allow you to be consistent. And if you're consistent in your treatment of each and every person, you yourself will be therefore safe. So we've talked about the governing agencies a little bit. We had the federal as well as the state protected classes, right? I want to talk about also how you uh, do some risk reduction for yourself. And anytime that we have rules that we have to follow, I, I get questions every day from agents about the rules we have to follow. And that's rules are our are, are global umbrella. I always say, let's begin by identifying who is providing that rule that we must follow. What's the governing agency? Therefore, if the concern that we have is relative to, um, is relative to a federal law, that's gonna trump state and local law, right? Federal law always trumps state and local law. State law will absolutely trump our code of ethics and the rules that NAR puts into place or our board of realtors puts into place. So you always wanna think about if I'm following a rule, who is, in, who is the governing agency that tells me I must follow that rule? So you have the federal level, the state level, and then there's a third category, um, uh, your um, trade association and your boards of realtors. And then there's a fourth one. And that fourth one is civil rules, the civil courts. Uh, so we not only don't want to get in trouble with governing agencies, in other words, the violation of laws, we also want to protect ourselves from what? From getting sued. So you have federal, you have state, you then have uh, industry, and then you have, of course, the civil level. So the federal level. The federal level, the most important thing to bear in mind is antitrust laws, antitrust violations. The governing agencies that look into this are the Federal uh, Trade Commission, the FTC, and the DOJ, the Department of Justice, as well as HUD, EPA, um, and so on. So all of these different organizations um, on a federal level implement rule sets that we have to follow. The one that is out there the most looking into our industry and the practicing of our industry would be housing and urban development relative to fair housing, and then the Department of Justice relative to business practices. There was a very famous case that became, got national attention that came out of Syracuse back in the early 70s. It was around 1972. A woman named Mary Dolan was a broker and fellow brokers uh, were not playing in the sandbox nicely with her. She called up the Department of Justice and they did an investigation and real estate brokers were actually arrested. <clears throat> and we're gonna talk a little bit about um, that experience in a, in, a, in, a, in a moment or two. So the first thing to bear in mind when interacting um, uh, in your new endeavor of real estate, <clears throat> leases slash rentals transactions are 25 times more likely to generate a fair housing complaint. That's a true statistic and it's pretty staggering. Uh, leases, rentals, 25 times more likely to generate a fair housing complaint. Um, therefore, a lot of uh, various brokers and or um, branches um, from various brokers choose not to entertain that form of business. Um, my office does not do um, 
do, do very much uh, rentals. Um, our previous owner of a portion of the Howard Hanna family, Realty USA, the owner Merle Whitehead, uh, towards the end of his having that organization, really said, I'd like us to stop doing rentals simply from a risk reduction standpoint. Now, that's a, that, that's a very different comment to make when you're talking about your, your Buffalo offices versus your Chittenango, New York offices. Um, because in Chittenango, New York, there's very little uh, rental business whatsoever, but in uh, where there's higher density of houses, there's far more rentals. But do know that if you're going to work the rental market, because there's opportunity there for you to service the public and help them with their needs, as well as make a living for yourself, um, know that there's 25 times more likely uh, to generate a fair housing complaint. The real estate industry has been under heavy scrutiny from the federal government for decades. So when I mentioned uh, the Mary Dolan case in Syracuse, that was about 1972. And that was one of the first cases national, that got national attention. So we're talking since the early 70s, it really has been decades. Um, the federal government suspects that multiple listing services have been vehicles for something that's a big no-no in business called uh, price fixing. So when you look into your MLS and you see where, uh, where the offering of compensation to a co-broke is given, say uh, a three for 3% or 3.5 for three and a half percent, whatever that number is. All the time I see agents see, looking at it and going, oh, it's three for uh, a buyer's agent and then it's uh, abbreviation. So they don't know what it really means. Oh, the other three must represent that they took this listing at 6%. That is an, one factually incorrect. If you're seeing a multitude of ways, it's because they're they're, off, they're um, articulating the offering of compensation to a broker's agent, a sub-agent, and a buyer's agent, the types of agency that the person interacting with the buyer might have with that buyer. It is not, it is not in any way, shape, or form the offering of, of compensation to the person working with the buyer as well as to themselves. We may not talk in terms of uh, commission structure with anybody. However, the federal government perceives boards and MLS is potentially doing that. And frankly, back in the 60s and prior to that, that's exactly what they did do. The laws were different then, they weren't as stringent. And we could back 50 years ago, have conversations about what we would list properties at. We no longer can do that. And we haven't been able to do that for decades. So one of the roles of trade associations used to be setting reasonable and fair fees. Nothing could be further from the truth today and any appearance of price fixing will be vigorously investigated and prosecuted. I'm going to give you a quick anecdote. I was at a, um, I was at a, uh, the board of realtors itself. Big, big, uh, a big. We have a big room for training. There was about 150, 120, somewhere in there, agents that were that took a two-hour class. That class was um, uh, a person that travels around the country. Um, lecturing to real estate agents, a guy named Dickie Betts. Um, I remember his name because he's got the same name as the guitarist from the Allman Brothers, a little trivia. Um, and Dickie Betts came in, he presented. Afterwards, I went up to thank him for joining us, having a private one-on-one -on -one conversation. And another uh, manager from another organization came up, rudely kind of inter interjected into the conversation. Okay, that's fine. Um, but what he started to talk about had... Uh, Mr. Betts get literally turn white and have a horrid, horrid look on his face because this person came up and started to talk in terms of, isn't he clever because they list it, they list properties at such and such a price and they keep say 4% and they offer 3% and how much it's added to his bottom line. Bottom, what, what transpired is this, this guy was so proud of himself for making money, he felt compelled and couldn't control himself to brag by my being there standing next to him, he broke federal law and he literally created a felony. And Mr. Betz's face um, uh, turned ashen uh, at the sight of it. Um, something as simple as water cooler talk with fellow agents about um, what they list at, unless they work in your company, is a complete uh, no-no, it is against the law. So there are three components to prove an antitrust violation. 
and we're talking antitrust law because we're talking on the federal lover, level, is there a conspiracy? And so what is a conspiracy? Um, a conspiracy is when you have a certain number of people, and that is as little as two, two or more people conspiring or, or conniving with one another. Um, <clears throat> it has to be among competitors. So there's a lot of us here on this call today. We could start talking about what we list things at because we ourselves are not competitors. Um, we're all under the same brokerage. Um, now we're independent contractors, but by being independent contractors, that does not um, rise to the level of us being considered um, by the federal government as competitors with one another. And the reason for that is we all work under the same broker license, right? So in Syracuse, it's all of us, about 340 of us work under Mark Ray's license. We therefore are not competitors, nor are any of us because we're all under the Howard Hanna, Howard Hanna umbrella as well. Um, to, um, and what do they say one must one would be conspiring about? It's either to fix prices, reduce choice, and or to boycott some entity. Fix prices, reduce choice, or boycott an entity. And you either need the intent, um, either the intent or the effect is sufficient to convict. So in that instance with Pete that I talked about, his intent was not bad. It genuinely wasn't. Mary fortunately convinced the consumer that that was the case. But had she not been able to convince him that his intent was not there, intent does not matter because if the effect itself can, um, can be sufficient to convict somebody. Okay, and what do penalties include? Because these are federal crimes, it's actual um, possibility of prison. And so the people in 1972 that were boycotting this woman, Mary Dolan, they were looking at prison time and or triple damages. So if you make $10,000 on a close and the property closes and that was your income, you might have to give $30,000 back because it's triple damages if you're found to have violated federal law relative to antitrust rules. Okay, so the government strategy in prosecuting antitrust cases is as follows. We have more money and more lawyers than you do and we will drag it out until you settle on our terms, right? The federal government has endless resources. No broker, no matter how large and how well off, has the same resources that the federal government does. Hey, so, Chris, can I ask you a quick question? Are you sharing a screen? Sorry, I had to take a phone call. I am not. Okay, good. Just yep. wanted to make sure. Yep. Um, so because um, they have more money than us, uh, what do people that find themselves um, uh, with a violation claim against them do? Uh, they make a plea of no low contendere, no low contendere, which is Latin for no contest. It's basically crying uncle. It's not a, um, a plea of innocence. It is not a plea of guilt. It is a plea of I cannot compete with you, the federal government, financially. So I'm calling it a no contest. And basically, I therefore am at the mercy of the court. Not a good place to be. So that's the federal level. Um, on a state level, um, there's a methodology. And you need to understand how the system works. So. Um, Let's say there's a violation here in New York State. It's not a federal complaint, it's a state complaint. Here's what transpires. The request for the completed file is made by the Department of State directly to your individual broker. So John Doe consumer files a complaint, Department of State will call up your broker and say, we need to see the complete file. So when your admins are saying to you throughout the course of your career, excuse me, you need to get some paperwork into us, do it please. Because at any given moment in time, this could present itself. Also the state reserves the right, even without a complaint to audit files. So always, always, always have your paperwork handed in. 
So they're going to make a, a request for the file. They're going to review the file. Then they do what's called a field investigation. And a field investigation is where just that, a, a, an employee of the Department of State comes out to the, your local market and does an interview. Says, please tell me what took place. You are allowed to have your manager and or your broker with you at that moment in time. And that field investigator then sends a report back to New York. If there is a finding that there's a potential that a violation was actually point in fact, worthy of continuing to investigate, they will call a hearing. And one needs to go to Albany and sit at the hearing itself. I can say in a 22 year career, this has presented itself, not directly with me, but three times I am aware of, and yet I'll have 420 transactions across my desk this year. So I'm doing thousands of transactions over 22 years that I've been a party to. I've seen it happen three times and I've not been a party to the violation three times, I've been aware of it. So it does not happen that often, but when it does, it's an awfully scary proposition to the people involved. In all of those instances, only one time did it arise to the occasion of there actually being a hearing. So they did the field investigation and they realized two out of three times, um, anecdotally to, to my observations in Syracuse, two out of three times, and there's probably been more that I'm not aware of, right? But two out of the three times, it was, it was an innocuous situation. It was an erroneous uh, complaint that was filed. Sometimes consumers just are pork chops, right? And they, um, they, uh, they file a complaint because they are not nice people. Um, okay. The other thing to bear in mind is it can be two years or more before you know you have a complaint filed against you. So the complaint might come in and the wheels of the government turn slowly and you might not hear about it for another year and a half, two years later. Also, the consumer has the right to wait a lengthy period of time before they even file the complaint. So in the previous um, slideshow that we were talking about, it was saying take incredibly good notes this is one of the reasons why. It could be two years later when someone all of a sudden knocks on your door and says, we're investigating how you conducted yourself. And it might be as simple as two years earlier, a person came into your office and said, I'm a buyer and you didn't offer them a cup of coffee. If you don't have good notes that you take at the end of the day about who you were interacted with, et cetera, are you going to recall what you did two years ago and that you did or didn't offer them a cup of coffee? So always take notes and always hang on to them. Now, when the state looks into things, they're looking for um, not just malice, but they are going to ask a question of, is this person either incompetent or untrustworthy? Incompetent or un untrustworthy. Um, I don't think any of us are. We wouldn't be here but that is what they're seeking from us to identify if that's the case. So intent when one breaks the law uh, does not matter uh, because it's a demonstration of incompetence. So what will they do? Think, I'm gonna use an analogy. Think in terms of you're driving down the road and the police car lights go on behind you, you pull over. What's the first thing that they say to you? License and registration, please, right? License and registration. Well. The analogy is this, your real estate license is your license like your driver's license. Your New York State Agency Disclosure Form and your New York State uh, Housing Discrimination Disclosure Form are your registration. We all have the license, but we also better be able to provide our registration and or, in this analogy, our agency disclosure and our fair housing disclosure right away. So those uh, two documents need to be signed when you first start interacting with someone, when you have first substantive contact. Um, some years ago, Mr. Whitehead, who owned Realty USA, did an internal audit of his own company um, about the number of agency disclosure forms that he had. And his findings were, at that time, we're talking early 2000s, he pulled randomly 65 files, 16 of which had the um, um, New York State Agency Disclosure Form. That means 75% of the time, agents at that moment in time 
we're in violation of the law. And then Merrill got very serious about internal checks and balances and measures to make sure that agents have them. <clears throat> Therefore, let's not fall into the category of someone that's nominal now. In fact, we're, we're probably somewhere near zero, but don't be the person that is not getting those two documents signed. Because not only are you in potentially in violation of law, you also are um, running the risk of putting your commission at risk. Because anytime a violation is identified, the money um, needs to be given back that was earned. It's perceived as if you broke the law. So I could do a transaction. I could do a great job. I could have a very happy consumer. Um, New York State could come in and just simply audit our files. And if they discovered that there was no New York, New York State agency disclosure form and or fair housing uh, form, they would say, you broke the law by not having these documents signed at first substantive contact, therefore you did not earn your commission, therefore you must give us the commission back. Now, um, so we know everyone needs to disclose, we've talked about that, <clears throat> the New York City Agency Disclosure Form, you actually have to do it every time the agent, the, the relationship with that consumer changes. So from the time you start working with a consumer to the time that you're no longer working with them, the likelihood is your relationship with them will have changed. So perhaps someone asked me to come to their house to list their house. I might therefore be a seller's agent and fill out the agency disclosure form in that manner. Two weeks later, they might say, okay, um, we're getting activity on our house. We also should start looking for a house. Just because I have a New York State agency disclosure form with them does not mean now because my relationship changed with them that I'm in compliance because now I'd be acting in the capacity of a buyer's agent and therefore I would need a second one. And then maybe a, a couple of weeks later, we sell the house and it's a fellow Howard Hanna agent that is, um, that is bringing the buyer to us on the sale of their existing home. And therefore we are either in a dual, uh, we're in a designated dual agency capacity. So with one person, my relationship can change, can change multiple times and therefore make sure you don't just do it the first time, do it every time the agency relationship changes and do it in a timely fashion because failure to do so can cost you more than a fine. It can actually cost you the commission dollars. Okay, now civil cases. Uh, the most common for a civil case is a physical condition of the property. Somebody moves in, then the roof leaks, what are they gonna do? They're gonna sue. And the strategy typically is this. They call their attorney, hey, I'm disgruntled, my roof is leaking, I should never have bought this house. The advice that they are gonna be given is throw stuff on the wall and see what sticks. Don't just sue the your agent, sue the your agent, your agent's broker, sue the other agent, the other agent's broker, sue the seller that sold you the house, and we'll just see how it plays out. Um, so so uh, it's most commonly the physical condition of the house. Um, and uh, yes, we live in a what's called caveat emptor or let the buyer beware state, and they probably did a home inspection, et cetera, but people can get disgruntled after the fact. Um, so know that the most common cause is physical condition and therefore don't fall into the trap of encouraging buyers to not do home inspections. It can very much cost you. Also, the law is not always logical and can sometimes seem unfair. There were two cases in Buffalo. Both were sinking houses cases, serious problems with the foundation. And what transpired was the judge decided in the first case that the seller was responsible for 75% of the damages uh, the listing company, 20%, the buyer themselves, who was the one that sued for 5%. Um, so, you know, every eight cases in, is different. And oftentimes it's not just two parties involved in a case, it's a multitude. And oftentimes uh, the ruling becomes, you know what, you all share a little bit in the liability of what transpired. With that, um, the most serious case that I want to talk to you about or issue that presents itself that presents itself as problems for agents, the most serious one is lead paint. Because it's not just that there's damages, it's not just limited to the structure, uh, they include damages to health. Um, 
So here's a real life example from about two to three years ago in New York State. An agent listed at a house 10 years earlier. The house expired, it never sold. The seller said, you know what? We're, we're not gonna move. Thank you for your time, but we're not gonna move. 10 years goes by, they still live in the house. Then they relist. At that time, agent does all new paperwork with them. The house sells, buyer moves in, everyone goes about their business. And unfortunately, someone that was living in that home um, got lead poisoning. And therefore, the Department of Justice reached out to that broker and said, show us all of your paperwork. And they, um, they actually subpoenaed the paperwork. They interviewed the agent under oath to define whether or not the agent's actions rose to a level of criminal negligence. It wasn't that they, the question wasn't, did this agent uh, willfully break a law? It was, did they just screw up the paperwork? Ultimately, the finding was, you did not need to know 10 years earlier how someone filled out a form. The form in question was the, was the lead-based paint disclosure. The sellers had filled it out one way 10 years earlier, a different way 10 years later. Somebody got sick. Th that listing agent in no way, shape, or form should have recalled how they filled out one document 10 years earlier. But it was a serious enough nature that even though it seems intuitively like that shouldn't even be reviewed, the person was subpoenaed. So lead paint is serious and uh, make sure that you're continuously doing that document and hanging on to it. The New York State, uh, I'm sorry, the federal document, uh, the lead-based paint disclosure form. And make sure that you have a complete annotated, annotated file because that's always your, always your best defense. Okay, so realtors must always disclose all known material and latent defects. Um, if there's problems with the house, you must disclose. Also remember, in a summary, do not uh, discuss commissions with anyone um, uh, that's someone whom you compete with. Um, never do it with a competitor. You may do it with the consumer all day long because you have to have that conversation. You can do it with your fellow Howard Hanna agents because we're um, not competitors with one another. And do everything you can to avoid a hearing with the Department of State. It's not a fair and impartial hearing. Um, but like I said, in the instances I've been aware of, um, we've never seen an agent um, uh, fail. But you can actually go on Department of State's webpage and read all sorts of cases where they have. So keep great notes. Email can be a huge help. If something arises that makes you uncomfortable, Part of creating a safe harbor is you send yourself an email. Hey, today on Thursday, I was having this discussion. The consumer asked me a question that I felt was out of bounds. I'm just sending a quick note to myself to remind myself of how I responded. Um, send yourself emails and get in that habit and create a file where you can store them because they're time stamped. Um, give everyone who signs a copy of what they signed, give them a copy of it back. And, um, and never sign for somebody. Don't sign the paperwork on their behalf um, and get those signatures as soon as possible. Always include a home inspection when you represent a buyer. Always consider a home, warrant home warranty and don't get caught up in the sense of false urgency. Oh my gosh, it's a you know crazy market right now. We're seeing houses get 10, 15 offers on them. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, if you want this house, don't do the home inspection. You make that simple statement, which is being done a fair amount, unfortunately, and the seller moves in, I'm sorry, the buyer moves in and the roof leaks, there's a very good chance that a lawsuit might take place and you find yourself with a civil problem um, in civil court. So don't get caught up in that false sense of urgency. Now, if the buyer chooses not to do the home inspection, that's their prerogative. They're an adult. They're making a decision for themselves, but don't be the person that encourages it. And remember that there's a higher level of responsibility to a buyer if you're their agent. If you are a buyer's agent, your fiduciary responsibilities rise to a higher level. Lastly, people don't file lawsuits against people whom they like. So let me come back to where I can see all. Any questions on that? Wow, silent group, anybody? 
All right. They are, they are very quiet today, Chris. Um, sure I was going to share, a, based on something you just said, um, a story that's been shared with me. Um, if you are in a group of people and they're talking about commission or steering or blockbusting or redlining or any of those types of activities, make a little bit of a scene before you leave so that you're remembered. Drop a notebook on the floor, slap your hand on the desk, say, I'm out, this is Maggie, I'm out of here, I'm not participating and then leave because you'll be remembered as having been someone who spoke up and made some noise and left. Uh, it'll stand out uh, and it helps protect you. It may happen. I was um, going to the funeral of a realtor and I started to hear some realtors behind me because there's hundreds of them in line starting to talk about commission and I moved. I went to the end of the, <laughs> the line on the pretense I didn't want to be anywhere near them. Um, and I just, I left. So just make some noise and get out of the way. Does that make sense, everybody? Did you all go it mute looks today? Like you're just about finishing. looks yeah. like you're just about finishing off. And I might want to, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind adding my two cents to that. That might be pertinent right now. I bet there are three. Go ahead. Three cents. Um, <laughs> I just got off of, a, of an annual Zoom that our Chamber of Commerce, which is now called the Center State um, Economic Forecast. I just finished it, just got off to come on to teach the class, you know, that we're doing in a few minutes. And the president, Rob Simpson, got on and he closed the racial inequity and making sure that leaders step up and um and take a stance on that and push that whole thing hard i've never i attend this every year i've never heard that before uh, we're seeing that at uh, nisar as well um and i i just ended that and i actually did a post on my facebook about it without being political but i mean because he ended with that um, and for him to tell 325 Central New York leaders that, and you just happened to say what you're saying, I thought it was it was timely to mention that. So sorry for horning in on your on your last two seconds or two minutes, uh, Chris. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled to have you. And I I I, I'm, um, I tried to go to that same meeting. I was uh, I'm a bit jealous that I wasn't able to be here, be there for it. But I'll get a recap I know from you. It was and And um, I got to meet all of these lovely folks. Yeah. And, we're and a I village, was told right? yesterday that they were doing that they were a good um, bunch as far as back and forth. So I'm looking forward to some give and take. <laughs> yeah, this has been a, this was a quiet morning, but it's it's a, a heavy topic. Fair housing. I know. Is there everybody is. ready to run for the hills? <laughs> yeah. So, did I, so Mark's going to change direction much? here, and it's going to get to be a more fun topic. Chris does a great job on fair housing, though. So thank you so yes. much for that, Chris. Does. does anybody else have any other questions for Chris before we? Anything on what I covered today? I have a question, Chris, for you. Yes. Um, how often does that happen, those lawsuits? Is it very often or is it kind of like uh, once in a while? I mean, I when I hear the stories after 10 years, you know, this is kind of like, who thinks about this, you know? So it's a very fair question. I guess the way I would respond is, um, what is a lot? You know, what, what I would perceive a lot, uh, one is a lot in my mind. And certainly one is a lot if it's someone who's under my charge as a manager, you know. Um, uh, so one is one is too many. The, the instances that, that I've uh, directly uh, witnessed over these years, and there's been very few, um, we, we did nothing wrong. Um, as I was saying, you know, sometimes people are just pork chops. Um, it's disgruntled people who are not happy. Um, usually they have a very interesting relationship with money, they themselves, and they like it a little too much. Um, uh, but it doesn't mean it's not an incredibly scary proposition for the agent, even for me, the manager. Um, and so um, I, I, that's not a direct way of answering your question, but it's the best way I, I, I can. I, 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 I might also add to that. Remember I began with showing you the Newsday article and seeing those statistics of how frequently on Long Island they were find, um, finding with hidden cameras that, that there were violations, you know, 49% of the time for African-Americans as an example. Clearly there aren't enough. So on the one hand, one is too many and scary to us in the industry, but I would rather be scared a dozen times for the industry to correct itself. And it's really not an industry issue, it's a societal issue, right? 
it's a societal issue. So um, maybe a long-winded way of saying, um, I think that we will see in 2021, um, uh, fair housing becoming um, the real subject matter of our industry um, because it's also on the consciousness of the entire country right now as well. If we think back to this past summer, right? So that's that's it for me. I, I'll take any other questions that you have. Otherwise, okay. Yeah, Jens, I was just gonna add that if you guys wanna protect yourself with regard to fair housing, first you have to have a process and you have to do the same thing all the time with 100% of your clients. If you're doing the same thing for every client that helps protect you. If you're getting your first substantive contact and you're doing your agency disclosure, your fair housing and right now your COVID forms, that's going to protect you. If you're using your Howard Hanna email rather than personal email, that's going to protect you. If you're gonna keep notes on every meeting, how many miles you drove, what you did, what you discussed, where you went, how the conversations went, that's going to protect you. If you have a process that goes from A to Z and you check off your process every time and you haven't left anything undone, you treat everyone exactly the same. And it's that's hard because you're gonna like some people innately more than others, but you can't treat them differently because you feel somewhat differently. Does that make sense? So don't let it scare you, new people. But don't, don't be scared. Scare just have a process and just just cross, dot your I's and cross your T's. Use your Howard Hanna email. If in doubt, who do I want you to go to? It's the same person every time I ask this question. Who do I want you to go to? Somebody tell me. Maggie. Not no. Teasing. Your manager. manager. Go to your managers, not Maggie. No, not Maggie. Go to your managers. Go to Absolutely. your managers. Go to your regionals. Those are the people who can help you and guide you and direct you. And if you think you've made a mistake, be accountable, be apologetic. Don't make excuses for your mistake. Just say it was on me and I'm I'm sorry and move and, and do what you can to rectify it if you can. You can't take everything back, right? Um, and then move on. And you will make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Just and believe me, be accountable. <laughs> and believe me, have no compunction or hesitation to go to your manager. Being one, my, if my agents don't feel that comfort level, I'm doing something wrong. Um, Go to your managers. You will not be in trouble. They are your advocate. They are your friend. They will take care of you. I have had to go to see Mark Ray. You know, an agent, some, something presented itself. It was an agent in my office. I've turned to Mark Ray. I had no hesitation to say, Mark, I need your help here. He jumped on board. He helped tremendously with it. There was no issue. We were fine. But nonetheless, um, uh, you know, that's his role in how we have things structured here in Syracuse. He's my go-to person. He's my broker. Yeah, don't work in vacuums, work in your group, work in you your master group. You got it. Maggie, someone just asked a question in the chat. Does e and cover, what is yeah, that kind of thing? And if you don't mind me um, chirping Please in do. on that, um, e and was fantastic. We, ha we have e and we have, um, and to cover you, our deductible is $50,000, 25,000 goes towards your, um, of course, I'm talking to different areas. so. No, it, it, it's all the same, though, I believe, in all the areas in New York. Um, Jen is saying yes, 25,000 goes to to, um, towards <laughs> legal. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I, I said Jen is saying yes, say? and I trust her. Jen is saying yes. Is it? it is. It, everyone oh. is under the same E&O policy across New York State. Okay. So it's $4 million, $50,000 deductible. 25,000 of that is against um, legal fees. We, we pay the first 25 and the other 25 is against any settlement. So let's say we lost this lawsuit of a million dollars. We're responsible for 25,000, 975,000 is covered by E&O. It does not cover, E&O does not cover illegal or activity or fraud. But other than that, you know, it does cover a variety of things. And I might wanna add, please, please, I mean that, Maggie, and I'm sure Chris before that, gave you some sage advice. Treat everybody the same and keep notes and keep records. You're, you're, over 50, you're way over 50% there if you're keeping records and treating everyone the same. A quick story, if you don't mind. I got into the business when I was 21. I had a listing, a really good listing I was excited about. And the homeowners said that they were hooked up to the sewers. 
and I sold it at an open house. And the buyer said, are you hooked up to sewer? And I said, yes. And they filled that out on this, on the, and I filled it out on the disclosure sheet that they were hooked up to sewers and it closed. And guess what? Sewer was at the road, but was not connected to the house. It cost $1,000 in a lawsuit. $500 came out of my commission and $500 came out of our broker's commission. In those days, um, the sellers, the homeowners did not sign the bottoms of the profile sheet. They initialed the top. That lawsuit against me when I was 21 in Syracuse, New York is what changed our board to make it so that they now sign the bottom of the profile sheet because then that wouldn't have worked. I learned my lesson on my first transaction and it made me not scared, but very, very what Maggie said, cross your T's, dot your I's. Knock on wood, 40 years later, uh, you said how many lawsuits? No, uh, out of all the laws, uh, all the transactions we do, they're minuscule. But just, I learned my lesson early, so it made me much more conscientious. So I'm hoping you'll learn the lesson by listening to my lesson. <laughs> With that said, I'll be quiet. Well, don't be um, too quiet, because you're up next. <laughs> well, they, they, they probably need a, do they need a five minute break or are we going right into it? You're the boss. I, I think they could probably use five minutes. And with that, I'm going to thank every one of you for uh, for your uh, time this morning, for your uh, attention this morning. Um, I hope to someday be back in front of you with a more uplifting uh, subject matter, and maybe in the afternoon when I've had more coffee in me as well, um, with a higher energy <laughs> thanks, level. Thanks, Chris. But thanks, thank everybody. You, Chris. Great to see you. Take care. Thank right. you. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. He's awesome. 1037, back in your seats, please. And with that, I'm, I'll be right back. <laughs>
Has anyone had any luck with the um, Facebook business page putting in that fair housing notice? I'm having a hard time finding where to put it other than changing the name, which would not be a good idea. Um, Hey, Maggie, do you know the answer to what Shauna just asked? Or Natalie, do good if you're still on. Do you Shana, know the answer I'm sorry, to, what um... was your question? Oh, I was having a problem trying to find where to put that um, fair housing notice in the um, top section of the page. It's really only Facebook. for Facebook. Your Facebook sorry. page? Yeah. Um, on your business page? Yes. I'll look into it and, and Natalie and I'll get back to you with an answer. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, it looked like it was at the top and I don't know if maybe he just put it in maybe as instead just almost like it's his own website link like every business page can link to a website maybe it was like the only link kind of to his company website but instead of putting like his Howard Hanna thing he put the fair housing notice. Yeah uh, let me just sense. go uh, you, there's a way to do your cover picture and put things in so I'll just have to go look at it. Okay. So I'll get back to you. Great thanks. I promise. So I'll defer to you, Maggie, and you tell me when you want me to begin. Yes? Okay. <laughs> hey there, I'm Mark Ray. I'm the Vice President of Regional Man uh, Manager for the Central New Northern New York and in in Syracuse um, area. So uh, with that being said, the, today's session is understanding people and communication skills. I'll go as fast or as slow as you like. This is a give and take. You are welcome to um, go ahead and you know ask me questions or ask to elaborate. I look forward to speaking with you and answering any questions you have. So uh, go ahead and take some notes and um, let's go ahead and begin. Um, I just wanna say before you go, this class is so much more fun if you talk to Mark. So talk to Mark, this is a lot more fun. Cool, thanks Maggie. The objective of the class is to understand the different types of behavioral styles of people and to be able to work with all types if you choose. You don't have to. If you're uncomfortable um, for whatever reason, you can. Re I would encourage you to refer it out to someone else in your office and ask for a referral fee. But the objective is to recognize the four types and be able to work with them all if you choose. I'd like you to do an experiment with me. Wherever you are, whether you're in your office, your home office, wherever you are right now, each of you, I would like to say out loud and very quickly, repeat after me. Shop, 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 shop. Go. Shop, 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 shop. Another time. Shop, 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 shop. One more time. Shop, 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 shop. What what's the white part of an um what do you do when you what do you do when you come to a green light? Go. But you had to hesitate. Did somebody start to say stop? There was a silence there for a while. There was a pause. Um, let's do it again with another one. Smoke, 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 Yolk. It's not the yolk. The yolk's the yellow oh. part of the egg. Egg white. Egg white. So what I just did in a few seconds is I did my best to kind of brainwash you. Um, I expected you to go ahead and say go instead of stop when you come to a um, green light. Um, and I expected you to say yolk instead of the white part of an egg is the white part of an egg. If I can do that, or we can do that in just a few seconds, you all come to this session with preconceived notions that you had with, since you were little kids. When you're little kids, you have, everything's wide open. And then when you grow up and you go to school and then you have your first job or, or second job or whatever, and you're dealing in the world, we get preconceived notions. And you're welcome to have those um, by all means. That's what's gonna help you succeed. But while you're in these sessions, not just with me, but with all of these fast start sessions or with your manager or whatever courses you take, I'd like you for the next hour or so, or however long we're together, 
um, to picture, you know, a, a little hook on the wall in the in the room you're in right now, and mentally take all those preconceived notions off just for the time that we're here together this morning and hang them on that hook and just be open-minded to listen to what we're going to discuss. I'm sure many of the things that we discuss, I think you'll agree with. Some you'll think, um, hmm, that gives me pause. And others you might think, oh, the guy's whacked, there's no way. Well, I'm, I'm, I just want you to be open-minded enough, ask questions, because we're here with some tried and true things. And if you expand your mind a little bit and embrace some of the things we discuss, you'll, you'll, um, you'll really, really um, learn a lot and exceed further. So with that said, how many agents agree with the following statement? If I sell the way I would like to be sold, then I would be losing at least half my sales. If I sell the way I would like to be sold, then I would be losing at least half my sales. I'm curious, raise your hands, although I can't see you all, but I believe there's about 30 of you out there. How many of you agree with that statement? Or better yet, how many of you disagree with that statement? If I sell the way I would be sold, then I'd be losing at least half my state of my sales. T um, agents tend, when I teach these class, to, dis um, to not agree with that at the beginning of the class. If I always do what I have always done, I will get what I've always gotten. If I always do what I've always done, I will get what I've always gotten. You agree or disagree? except that each year it's a little less until there is none left. I don't know how long, some of you are brand, brand new. Others have been in the business for a little bit of time. Um, those of us that have been around for a while have seen so many experienced agents, rock stars even, but medium to real successful agents that over time do a little less and a little less and a little less. And some of them are no longer in the business. They made the following mistake. Insanity, I'm sure you've heard that definition before, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And why do they make that mistake? Give me some feedback on that. Why do they make that mistake of doing the same thing over and over and not changing? Anybody give me an answer on that? Their comfort level. Sorry. Comfort level. And what, what is it about their comfort level that makes them makes them not want to do that. They're afraid of failure, rejection, failure and making a mistake. Thank you. Show me a person who has never made a mistake and I'll show you someone who has never achieved very much. When I was a branch manager and now as a vice regional vice president, I tell my managers and all of our new agents and our experienced agents when they come over, we have the good fortune of many coming over from other companies. Do not be afraid of making a mistake. I encourage you newbies. Do you mind me calling you newbies? I, I mean that as, as a form of endearment. I truly do. Um, don't be afraid of making a mistake. That's how you learn and grow. Those of you that have kids, when they first start to walk, do they get up and walk? They get up and try and they fall. And they get up and try and you encourage them and they fall. And they continue until they can finally walk. I, as a regional VP and your managers, as your managers, encourage you to go out there. You learn from your mistakes. If you don't try and fail, you won't achieve. So don't be afraid. The greatest mistake a person can make mm -hmm. is to be afraid of making one. Does anybody know what PMMFI might mean? I'm curious if anybody's heard that acronym, PMMFI. Anybody? No. It means, please make me feel important. Please make me feel important. Every human being out there, whether they're the CEO of this company, the person cleaning the um, toilets, and everybody else in between, I don't care who you are, we're walking around on the sidewalk, everybody you see, you look when you're walking around on the sidewalk. Of course, these days you don't see as many people on the sidewalk, do you? But you're gonna see some. And um, everybody's walking around with that pasted to their back. They wanna be made to feel that they matter and that they're important. And that's why we tend to fear um, you know, failure and trying something new because it makes us, makes us feel um, that way. And Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one 
can make you feel inferior without your consent. So know that and own it. They want to look at you because you made a mistake. That's on them. No one can, can it's, it's your reaction to it. No one can make you uh, feel inferior without your consent. The, Einstein, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking, you know, that created them. The level of thinking that, that got you where you are today will not get you to where you be are tomorrow. So you're in these fast start classes and you're learning some things that are exciting, that you're eager to use. And then there's some other things that you're really reticent about using. And I encourage you to take what I say, take what Chris said this morning, take what you're gonna learn in the next class and marry them to your personality. It doesn't have to be verbatim what I'm saying here today. Take the concept and marry it to your personality and to your way, but try it. We've done these things, trust me, they work. And don't be afraid of going. I'm, I'm encouraged if you go out there and make a mistake because you're gonna learn and you're gonna do better um, the next time around, I promise. Because a person's mind, once stretched to the new idea, never regains its original dimensions. So we're stretching your brains in Fast Start. And because you're new to the business, I want to take a second and say this. These classes can tend to be overwhelming because you're brand new to real estate. So everything you're learning is new to you for the first time. And it can be daunting. But know this, after you've gone through all of Fast Start and after you've had a listing and after you've made a sale and you've had an open house and you've got a few months behind you and you've learned some things, approximately 75% of what you're learning stays the same. Then 20 to 25% continue to learn. That's ever changing and ever evolving. So when I said at the beginning of this session, if, do you know anybody who was, were rock stars or were doing fairly well and now they're doing less or they're no longer in the business? They failed to um, exercise that 20 to 25% of continuous learning. And so right now, it's not always gonna be like this. You're not gonna be learning everything. 70 to 75% is gonna stay the same once you learn it, you own it, you got it, you're there. Just, but I encourage you, it's critical. That'll make, you, that'll make you successful if you continue to go forward because 20 to 25% is ever changing. Right now, you are getting into real estate and I've been around for 41 years. Again, I started 21. Um, and in all my 41 years, this has never been a better time to get in real estate. I mean that with my whole heart because whether you're, 65 or 25 or 45, I don't care what your age is. You, you're competing with a lot of agents who last February, March, didn't know the world's changed in real estate. You have to practice it differently. And everybody had to, had to make that change. So they had to unlearn some major things, whereas you're learning it right now to start. So you don't have any of those old habits to unlearn. So, and, with, and if, you're, if you embrace technology, you're on an equal basis. You can run, it, you really, really can. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. So there's four main behavioral styles. If you were to go on the internet or take a class on this, they might, it, it's driver, theorist, feeler, and analyst. If you were to take um, a class on this or go on the internet, you'll see these names you might see other names instead of those, but the traits, the personality traits they have are all the same. They might be uh, labeled differently depending upon what class you're taking, but the traits are all the same. There are simply four major uh, behavioral styles, driver, theorist, feeler, analyst. Anyone ever heard of neuro-linguistic programming? NLP it's referred to, neuro-linguistic programming. Anyone, just curious. Anyone out there ever heard of it? I'm going to elaborate and talk about that. It's the, it's the pseudo-scientific approach to communication and personal development. And you can use it to achieve work-oriented goals 
um, science issues that actually to treat people with PSSD, uh, PTSD and, um, and panic attacks and things like that. I am using this today to teach you towards work oriented goals and to create rapport and relationships and more success in being able to work with the four different relation, four different behavioral styles. So with that said, we're gonna talk about NLP or Neuro Linguistic Programming talks about mirroring, pacing or leading, matching behaviors, crossover matching. I'm gonna show you a way to see if you think you're in rapport, but you wanna know if you're in rapport to test whether you're in rapport. Um, one thing I wanna say, people that take courses on this, they can use it to manipulate people because it really is scientific and proven that there's different ways you can do things to manipulate people. I strongly feel you need to be sincere and go for the win-win in life. I can't win and you lose or you win and I lose. So many times you can always achieve a win-win. That's what you wanna go for and be sincere. I don't think you can fake sincerity. So if you don't feel it, don't say it, don't do it. So don't use that to, um, to manipulate. You know, um, I firmly feel if you put out good, you get good back. If you put out bad, you get bad back. You kind of reap what you sow. So just a word of caution on that, okay? Um, so speaking of that, there's your body language. It says everything. Um, you know, you can read people when you're on a listing appointment or a showing appointment or you're chatting with someone. There, we're, we're giving each other nonverbal clues all the time. Ge our gestures, whether we're looking at you with eye contact directly or we're diverting our eyes away, our posture, our appearance tells us myriad things um, immediately. So pay attention to that. I want to talk about mirroring and matching. This is a, they're a mirror image of one of one another. They're dressed very similarly. They got their coat over their shoulders, and that's. One thing I would like you to actually write down to remember about today's session. You can write down as much or as little as you want, but this one thing I want you to write down, sameness builds rapport. That's neuro-linguistic programming. Um, it's proven, it's scientific. Sameness builds rapport. Um, have you ever met someone, whether it be at an open house or casually, personally, at a party or a get together, been introduced to someone, you never saw them before, you never met them before, you just met them and instantly you like them. Anybody relate to that? Give me a raised hand or give me a yes or whatever. Can you understand that? Do you wanna know why you like them right away with just barely even speaking to them? It's because you related to them. Sameness builds rapport. You identified with them and they liked you in return. It's unconscious. You don't even know. It's unconscious. It's your appearance. It's their appearance, their appearance. Likewise, if you ever met somebody, they barely said two words. They may not even have said two words and you're just instantly did not like them. Can anybody raise your hand and relate to that? That's all tied into this. So I really want you to know, same this feels you poor. And that's where I'm going when I say you can manipulate people and I don't want you to do that. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. Regarding social media, are most of you using some sort of social media um, platform at all? I mean, that's the world we're in today, whether you like it or not. Some people do it more or less, but to at least do one thing and be out there. To me, social media, success is defined by how much my online world mirrors my offline world. I want them to be equally important and meaningful. Um, and I want to be genuine and, and, and uh, I want to be me. Uh, I want to talk about generosity and basically social media is nothing more than talking. Some people get nervous. I got to go on social media. It's just you're talking to them the same way I'm talking to you if you were sitting in the chair next to me right now. It's engage them, talk to them. A couple of things, though, I want to um, caution you about. Um, if you're going to use social media or be on social media, use it. If, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Instagram, um, whatever it is, you choose what you're most comfortable with. 
But if you're going to be on there and you're not going to be present, it actually works against you and makes you look bad. So don't even go there. Don't have a, a four different accounts and then you're never on it. And certainly always have a photo. So if you only want to be on one, God bless you, just use one. But, but go on it um, every day. Take 10 minutes a day and be present and engage people. And you're talking with them. Be consistent. It's networking. That's all it is. And you're building rapport consciously and, and unconsciously. So just, just be there and, and do that. Have any of you gotten any um, positive um, listings or sales or, or anything off the social media? Just curious if, if you've um, ever used it to be able to get um, some success from that regarding uh, listings and sales. Shauna? Yeah, yes? I, uh, I actually um, yesterday got a um, buyer from someone that I know, but interested because I have a listing with the lakefront property and they are actually also looking for a waterfront property. Cool. Um, you utilize it that way and reach out to people. Excellent. And communicate or use technology in their style, in their um, preference. That is critical as well. Let me elaborate. If they respond to you by, via text, don't call them on the phone. If they respond to you by a phone call, call them back with a phone. Um, I always go back. Um, sometimes it can be daunting because I'm like, okay, how did that person contact me? Did he inbox me on, on Facebook? Instant message me? Oh, I got to go back to him that way. Oh, was it a text? And I got to go look at my text and say, oh, it was a text and text back to him. They're, they're using their comfort style. It's, it's, it's incumbent upon us to make that person comfortable. When you're on a listing appointment, if you didn't get the listing, think about what did I do right? What did I do wrong? What can I do differently next time? Even if you succeeded and got the listing, still ask those questions to you. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? What can I do differently next time? And I'd ask them for feedback. Um, so if you didn't get the listing, maybe they were not comfortable for whatever reason. It's incumbent upon us to make them comfortable, not for them to make us comfortable. And um, the best way to respond to people is in their comfort zone, whether it's text, phone, social media, instant messaging, Zooming, FaceTime, or what have you. Make sense? So how do we respond to people? Um, if you're a driver, a driver is, who can, who can, well, there they are, right there. They're brief and to the point. They want one best idea and, and they don't usually have a lot of time. And you, what, what we used to have in our offices, we used to have hard copies of these books, seller's books and buyer's books called Buyer Advantage and Seller Advantage. We no longer have the hard copies, I don't believe, unless you have a few left over from, you know, from before. But we, uh, if Natalie's online right now, and I think she'll back me up, you, they're there to download and to customize. Correct, Natalie? And they're taught that at some point during this fast, fast start. I would encourage every one of you to download the buyer advantage and the seller advantage um, because they're great listing and selling presentations. And I'm gonna open up to one page right now um and there's this particular page right here a picture let me go up to see if i can see me to see what i'm showing you yeah um this is this is picture is a thousand words so if i'm going on a listing appointment with a driver i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna have my presentation download it and and have it there and ready and i'm gonna pull this out but I'm not gonna go through page by page by page by page. They'll throw me out because they don't have a lot of time, drivers don't, and they don't wanna hear a lot of talk. But I am going to show them that I have a thick book here available with all kinds of things and show them two or three of these fabulous pages. Because a picture is a thousand words and it says a lot and you can explain a lot right then and there. So I'm going to have it Customize it to yourself as you get better and you can have testimonials and you can customize it to yourself and whatnot. So customize it along the way, but right now just print it out the way it is and bring it on every one of your listing and buying presentations. And if you're with a driver, 
Let's say you're on a listing appointment. So Cheryl, I see your face on here. So I'm picking on you, if you don't mind. So let's say I go to your, um, normally when you're brand, you know, normally when you're, um, you get a brand new lead, you're going to go and make an appointment and go through the house. And they're going to walk you through and you're going to take notes. How many bedrooms? How many baths? Why are you selling? Are you looking to buy another house? Your questions and answers. Um, and normally you're going to come back, you know, a day or so later with a competitive market analysis and show them why, uh, you know, what their house is worth. Once you get to be really, really good. And if you got a personal referral, you might just go ahead and get the listing that day and, and share it with them. But right now you're brand new and you're going to go through and you're going to do as I just mentioned, and you're going to make an appointment to come back. When you go through, you're going to be able to read because people are always telling you who they are and what they are. They're always giving you signals. Um, if they're talking really, really fast and they're moving really, really fast and they're moving from subject to subject to subject, um, you know, you can probably get a sense that they tend to be a driver type personality quick. Um, and, and let me stop for a second. I mentioned there's four major personalities. Most people exhibit two of those predominantly and two, not so much. There are some people that have a little bit of all of them. It's rare, but that's, but that happens, but usually you're dominant in one or two and not so dominant in the other. And those are the people you kind of like them if they match or mirror your personality unconsciously, if you're a driver or not, or if you're not the other way. So you can kind of tell when you're going through the house, that first appointment, whether they're a driver or not. So if I've identified that they're a driver and I come back tomorrow, again, I'm going to have downloaded this whole book and I know I'm only going to use two or three charts. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. And I'm actually going to say, I know you don't have a lot of time. Make, make them comfortable. And I'm going to know that I might be spending an hour with them at tops. If I'm with an analyst, I might be spending two or more hours with them. So you know that going up front. Make sense? Um, a theorist. A theorist, you want to give them a lot of time. They're like more cerebral. They're, uh, they have ideas about things. And they're not really where a driver's dealing in the here and now. I've got, I don't have a lot of time. Let's get this done. A theorist is kind of slower and they're kind of, you know, thinking about, well, what about this? And what about that? And how do you do this? And they're kind of like, you know, that way, you know, to them, you want to take some time, ask them for their ideas and then be responsive to their ideas. There's a feeler type personality with them and they identify themselves right away. And by the way, there's no right or wrong or good or bad here. I'm just showing you the different um, personality traits that people tend to have that dominate their, their person, if you will. And so with them, with a driver, you know, they, they wanna get right to it and get it done. The feeler type personality is more traditional. They wanna get to know you. They wanna sense who you are. You're gonna wanna take a little bit of time for small talk. Um, if you happen to be on a team of two, three or four people, you're gonna to wanna to stress to that person. You're gonna be dealing with me, Chuck, um, every time. It, might, it won't be Jane tomorrow and Doris the next day and then me the third day. You're gonna be dealing with me, I'm gonna be, because they wanna know you. They want a relationship. They wanna be reassured that you guys are in this together. Can you see how that's a lot different from a driver or a lot different from a theorist? And then we have the analyst. Those are your engineer type people. What do you think about, a, um, what do you think if I go through and I realize that I'm dealing with an analyst and they're pretty easy to um, identify. What about if you go through on that appointment and you don't have any kind of a presentation and XYZ real estate goes through and they got charts and they got a presentation. Who's going to get that listing? What do you think? Um, so that's why you identify ahead of time who they are and then organize your presentation accordingly. And I'm going to give you a test. I think they gave you a test. They, they sent you the test ahead of time. Is that correct? Somebody yes, tell me Mark, if you got that. It was, it it was, was sent out here. yesterday. Okay, cool. Did y'all take it? Anybody yet? Just curious. 
I did. Um, I'm Who a said that? Feeler driver, Shauna. Okay, you're a feeler driver. Mm -hmm. I'm a feeler driver too. <laughs> the older I get, though, a little a little analyst goes in there. I never used to be. So you kind of evolve as you get older. I'll warn you. Um, you will change. You I'm more a feeler driver as well. So um, those of you that took it and those of you that didn't take it, your lowest score is the most like you and your highest score is the most unlike you. So you're automatically gonna identify with the people that are the most like you. So if I'm going on an appointment with the driver, I'm gonna, again, go, go ahead and, um, and go through things more quickly and use just a few charts as opposed to with an analyst. And if um, some of you might say, you know what? I don't wanna take two and a half hours every time I'm talking to somebody and I don't wanna go through all this. That's fine. Give it to somebody in your office who you think would be comfortable with that and ask for a referral fee. Or maybe you would go like to go through, um, you know, and spend all the time with an analyst, but you don't want to go through with somebody that, you know, you know, is um, another style that that is fine again as well. Or or choose to adapt and know that you're dealing with four different types and work with them all. Um, so you're going to want to tailor yourself to their needs without being phony and always being sincere. One thing that we tend not to do as salespeople, or as I like to refer to us as service people, because I think that's more what we do, but sales uh, is not a bad word, we're sales and service people. But in, in this profession, whether you're selling real estate or you're selling whatever it is you're selling, sometimes we, we you know, are wanting to get that listing or are wanting to make that sale and people are giving us objections or they're talking to us and we're thinking about what we're gonna to do to overcome that objection, take a deep breath. Don't worry about it. Listen to them. You're 80% of it there. Um, you're 80% there. People just want to know that you hear them and want the respect to know that you're listening to them. So what I would say, you know, there's active listening and there's passive listening. Um, you can't truly listen to anyone and do anything else at the same time. So if you're thinking about what you're going to say to overcome, they know you're not hearing them and you're just trying to overcome and they're not going to trust you or feel like you're on the same page. True listening involves a setting aside of oneself. It also temporarily involves a total acceptance of the others and they automatically understand that you're accepting them. So Cheryl, if you're talking to me and I'm listening and I'm nodding, and then I turn back and say to you in a paraphrase, so what you're saying is this, they're gonna come back and say, exactly. And they're gonna breathe a sigh of relief, their shoulders will go down, and then when you respond to them, they're going to listen to you. It's automatic, it's human nature. So don't worry about overcoming the objection while they're talking. Hear them, paraphrase back so they know you listened. You will gain so many more end roads. Anybody um, relate to that? Anybody want to comment on that? Anybody want to say anything about that? I'm curious. Anybody ever had an experience where that, that makes sense to you? Okay. Um, so listening's the key. Take the time because they want to know that you understood their needs and concerns. You're going to plan your approach when you go back the next day for your competitive market analysis. Know that with a driver, it's going to be quicker. With an analyst, it's, you got to take more time. And if you didn't get the if you didn't get the listing, just call them up and politely say, you know what? Oh, just give me some feedback. I'd like to know, you know, what I could have done differently or what what were you know? I would ask and practice. I said in the beginning of this, um, it's okay to fail. Um, just continue to do it. That's the biggest biggest thing. When I'm when I'm asking my managers to recruit from other companies. I know that like you prospecting like them, sometimes it's, it's scary. It's re fear of rejection and all those things. Well, if you didn't prospect, if you didn't um, go out there and, and try to get other people, you're no more further ahead. You didn't, you failed to begin with, but when you make the call or you hold the open house or you call back on somebody that came to the open house or you reach out to someone, you're, um, you're learning, you're going to win some of the time. And the more you do it, the more you're going to succeed and the better you're going to be at it. Practice. It develops skill. 
I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. I just want to encourage you. It works. I see it happen every single day. Any questions around that? Anything at all? I was just going to say, practice with the people in your office, because in your office, even if you're in a really small office, you're going to have people from all four categories. You can do this over Zoom. You can practice with people over Zoom, but you're going to have a variety of uh, people who have some experience, or maybe they're like you, they don't have any experience and they're willing to practice. Practice with people who are safe, practice with family members, practice with friends, practice with your office. The practicing with different groups will help you because your office has some understanding of the business. Your friends and family think they do, but they don't. And so they're going to ask different types of questions and they're going to help you to develop how to respond more quickly, more fluidly. And sometimes you're going to be tongue, tongue tied. So how do you get over being tongue tied when you need to respond? What are, what are the responses for, I don't know what to say? Because there are, you can have a body of responses to help you with that too. And I love what Maggie just said. Do the do the sam, do the listening presentation with one of the other agents in your office. After you've after you've done it, practice it on them or your husband, wife, or friend or whatever. That's a wonderful, Maggie. Um, because then you'll at least done it once or twice and you'll be more more secure in it um, by doing it that way. Um, write a um write up a, a purchase agreement on your sister's house or your best friend's house. Actually write it up and present it to them. What a wonderful way. And let them ask the questions that they would ask if they if it was J Jane Doe from XYZ Real Estate. They'll come back with their questions. And then you're comfortable with them. It won't be as scary. Maggie, that's terrific. I would encourage you to do that. Um, you'll grow from that. And what's funny about role play is people forget it's not real when they're role playing. Once you're engaged, you go for it, right? They, they forget and, and they get it gets re it feels real. So it's, it's a very valid way to practice your skills and to hone them. And when, again, when I was new in this and I would get nervous, we all get nervous. Two things I would do. One, I'd put um, music on that, that hyped me, that made me excited, that gave me confidence on the way to the house. It definitely works that way. You don't want to listen to something that go out of my way to listen to something though that's going to make me excited and make me feel confident. I would encourage you to do that. And just go ahead and do it. I always thought to myself, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'm not going to die. I'm not going to get the listing. That's the worst that's going to happen. But if I don't go, I, do, I already failed. So just have that little conversation or self-talk with you. So um, I want to ask you about how you buy. So um, let me pick on somebody else. Let me um, let me go through and see. Doris, are you there listening? Cool. I'm listening. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say that I'm I'm working with you to buy a house. Yes. I would actually ask you the question, Doris. How did you buy your last car? So I'm going to ask you, how did you buy your last car? Did you um? W when did you buy your last car? How long ago was it? My last car was seven years ago. Okay. And did you know what you wanted and you went, um, went out to the dealership and bought it? Or did you not know what you wa wanted and did you go online and do research and, and ascertain this is what I want? Did you do a lot of research or did you just know what you want and go out and do it? Great question. I knew what I wanted. I searched around for the best price. For the best price. Cool. Mm -hmm. And went out and bought it. I did. So when you buy a car or a house or an appliance or a bigger ticket item, you tend to know what you want and go out and do it. Is that right? Or do you do a ton of research on it? I know what I want, but I need the best deal. And I'm gotcha. typically a good shopper and I wanna make sure that um, even when I buy a car, if the guy agree, if the dealer agrees on the price, I kid around with my husband and I say, God darn it, I didn't go down low enough in negotiating the price. So that's our in-house joke. So I, um, I'd like to shop around. And um, when you bought your last house, um, do you mind asking, how long ago was that? That was 20 years. 
ago. And did you look at one house or 20 houses or 10 houses? Do you know? I absolutely do. We looked about 25 houses. Okay. Now, is, thank you very much. That was very, very helpful. Um, is there anybody else on this Zoom who went out and bought a car or a house or a bigger ticket item and just knew what you wanted and went out and just bought it without looking at um, um, Cheryl, tell me about what it was. Uh, this is, I'm realizing as you're talking that this is the way that I do things. Uh, pretty much our house that we bought in Pittsburgh, I kind of researched school districts. I saw one that I loved, walked in with the realtor who had listed it and made an offer. Um, same with the house here in New York. We saw it, we liked it. It was in the right place in the right school district. We made an offer and we pretty much do the same thing with our cars. <laughs> Both okay. of us, and my husband's cool. the same way. So we're not, we're not great negotiators in that way when it's for ourselves. <laughs> and you just brought something else up and I'm glad you said that. You said your husband's the same way. My wife and I are opposite. I'm like you and my wife is like Doris. So sometimes you're dealing with a couple that is two separate ways. And there's no right or wrong here, but I ask every, I would encourage you to ask everybody you work with what I just did with you. And then I would tell them why you're asking. So I would say to Doris, who I just asked, if I was taking her out this weekend and showing her houses, you know, Doris, I'm asking you this for a reason. We're in a marketplace right now where there's multiple offers on almost everything. And if you want it, you have to act quickly. And um, a lot of times people wanna, um, wanna sleep on it and that's your prerogative and you're welcome to do that. I want you to be comfortable, Doris. I might try to nudge you a little bit if I think it's the right thing for you and I think you're gonna lose out, but I want you to be comfortable. Cheryl, now I'm dealing with Cheryl. Cheryl, there's multiple offers on everything. We're getting two, three, four, sometimes 15. It's crazy out there. If you really wanna be sure you're gonna get it, you gotta act on it right away. But again, it's your prerogative, Cheryl. You have to be comfortable. Um, and, and let me stop for a second. So now I'm out, of, I'm out of my role play, okay? I wanna stop for a second. That's the world we're in right now. Trust me, in the mid eighties, it was like this. In 1986, it was this, the only, only other time it was this bad or good, depending upon you wanna frame it. In 1986, the houses were appreciating so much. If I did a, um, a competitive market analysis in March and uh, 10 days later, um, they wanted me to list it. I had to do another one. They were appreciating that quickly and there was multiple offers. That was the last time I knew of a market the way we're in now. So this market won't last forever. There, there's uh, everything cyclical. Well, everything is cyclical. We'll have good markets again, although this is excessively good, but we'll always have good markets again. And we'll have very, very slow markets where uh, you don't have to act right away. But right now we're dealing with the market we're dealing with right now. So I would, um, but I tell them, I have them, I go through this exercise and I encourage you to do that with everybody. So now I'm taking Doris out Saturday and I've shown her five houses and she's showing a lot of interest in this, in this uh, third house I showed her. She really, really likes it. So Doris, um, go, uh, I wanna continue with you. And yes. um, I'm gonna say, Dor I'm gonna say, Doris, remember when I first spoke with you? I told you there's multiple offers. If you really want it, you gotta jump on it. How badly do you want it? Um, you know, if, if you absolutely need to sleep on it and you're willing to lose it, God bless you, that's fine. But if you really, really want it, I would encourage you. And I would let you decide whether you wanna buy it or whether you wanna take the chance to lose it and it's okay. And that's how I would talk to you. How does that make you feel, Doris? It makes me feel like I need to look at five more houses. Okay, and so I know that I'm gonna take her out and show her five more houses and there's nothing wrong with that. Now I'm dealing with Cheryl. I'm gonna say, Cheryl, I know you really, really want this house and I'm not gonna be afraid. So I'm not gonna push Doris. If I push her, what's gonna happen, Doris? I'm gonna lose rapport with you and you're gonna get rid of me and find somebody else who doesn't care to show you five more houses, right? I also have a lot of loyalty. If I picked you as my realtor, I've done my research and I'm going to work with you. So I, I definitely have an issue of loyalty. So I'm going to work That's with great. you. I'm going to, say, I'm going to say, Mark, I need to see five more houses. After my five, I'll feel more comfortable. I've picked these five because I've driven around. Let's see these five and then let's sit down and talk. But the, but the fact that I'm having this open and honest, sincere talk with you is making you realize that, okay, we're on the same page and I'm not going to push you. I'm going to show you five more. I'm going to back down. 
Pushing doesn't Whereas bother with Cheryl, me. <laughs> what? The pushing won't bother me. That That's not an issue for me. Okay. Okay. But nonetheless, I am going to back down. I'm not going to, with Cheryl, I'm going to push her because I know I can. And it's, and it's going to be with, with that kind of a buyer. Again, there's no right or wrong. I just want to know my boundaries and how to, how to treat people. So I'm going to, I'm going to prompt her a lot more quickly and say, let's go in now. And it's your, it, it's on for, I don't know. It's on for 179.9. Do you want to go in and asking? Do you want to go in 5,000 above, 2,000 above, 10,000 above? Do you want to do an acceleration clause? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to nudge her and I'm not going to nudge you is what I'm saying. And so you want to ask your buyers that way. Let me tell you about when my wife and I bought our last house, we were in our, you know, price range and I'm a real estate agent. We know what else is out there, right? We're looking, we know we're the worst people. It's awful for people, uh, we're the worst people. So I've been looking, I knew the inventory. One Sunday we're driving, we happen to be going somewhere and I, and I drive by one of the better neighborhoods that I really was interested in. And I see an open house sign on the main street. I drove past it and I said, um, I want to turn around and go in there and see what's on the market. So I did a U-turn, went around and went in there, pulled in the driveway, went in the front door. The second I walked in, I knew I wanted this house. Open floor plan, sunk in the living room. I go into the dining room. I look out the picture window and I see this beautiful, huge, beautiful backyard. I wanted to put an offer in that second, but it was a little above our price range, which is why I didn't see it. I, um, I never saw it because it was, it was a bit above our price range. I could afford it, but it was a, a stretch. So I didn't, I did, it didn't come across my path. So my wife loved it as well, but I know my wife and I could have pushed her and we could have bought it that day. I took her out over the next week. It wasn't the market we're in today. And I showed her a dozen other houses to prove value of that house. And we bought that house. Now that I'm a little older, it's got that huge backyard. I'd like to downsize and she loves it so much she won't. Um, and, but anyways, that's another whole thing. Um, but my point is I could have pushed her that day and she always would have wondered and always, you know, I had to have her comfortable. So I had to take her out and show her a dozen other houses. And then we actually found one other in the same higher price range. And we compared the two and that original one won and we've been very happy there. But so you understand with a Doris, I'm gonna show her those other five houses and I'm not gonna to try to nudge her. And with Cheryl, it's okay, I'm going to push her. And you guys are gonna get so good. Trust me, you're gonna get so good. Shauna, when you take someone out and you show them a house, um, let's say you're gonna show them five houses. Have a good sense, which house you think they're gonna like and they're gonna buy. Cause you're gonna get that good. You're going to be able to drive by a house and without even going in and know what the, what the approximate value is. When you walk in, you're going to know what the value is without even doing a competitive market analysis because you're going to get that good as real estate agents. You still got to go through the process, but, um, but I'm just saying you're going to own it. And trust me, I told you I was a driver feeler. Tell me. The, my rate of speech, what you, how fast I'm talking, you kind of would have guessed by now that I'm a bit of a driver, right? Which I have to be cognizant of the fact that not all of you are, there's 30 people on this. So I got to try to consciously slow my speech. Some people it might annoy, other people might not mind. Um, so just be aware. Any questions around that whole concept? Cool. Um, you know how we're encouraged to do mailings and you might do holiday cards at holiday time and you might do other things at other times with neuro-linguistic programming this is something else I'd like you to take with you and write down if you will because this is scientifically proven um, there are six best times to mail or contact people contact them by you know whether it's text or phone call or however they like to be contacted. There are six best times of the year where they're much more apt to act than any other time. And they all have something in common. So let me know, what does New Year's represent to all of you when it's New Year's? What are you thinking at that time of year? Fresh start. Fresh new start, beginning. new beginning. 
What does spring recognize or think? What do you think about in the spring? It's the end of the winter, the beginning of spring, beginning of the new, uh, again, a new, um, it's springtime, winter's over. Memorial Day tends to represent, oh, it's the end of spring, beginning of summer. Labor Day, that time of year, not the actual day itself, that time of year of Labor Day. Oh, it's the end of summer. We're going into the fall, school, blah, blah. Halloween, again, it's the time of the year. That's, oh, the holidays are going to start. So you're transitioning. Birthday, the person's birthday, their own birthday. What do they have in common? Their change of life occasions. So, Shauna, Jens, is that how you say your name, Jens? That's a cool name. Um, so those times of the year, Jens or Shauna or Doris or Cheryl, those are the ones that are on my screen right now. That's why I'm saying your names. I don't mean to eliminate anybody else. Um, those times of the year, if you have a goal that you're going to buy, that you know you're going to buy a new car this year, you, we, all, we all have goals in our heads, on our minds, a couple of goals on our minds. Let's say you know that you're gonna be buying a new house. You're gonna be buying a new car. You're gonna be changing careers. You're gonna be buying a new computer. You're gonna be taking a course. Whatever it is that you have on your head, in your mind, you're much more apt to act upon it at these times of the year, unconsciously, subconsciously. They creep back up in, in, your, in your mindset unconsciously and consciously. So if you mail out or contact people at these times of the year, you're much more apt to get a, um, to get a bite. Does that make sense? Yep. So I would reach out and be conscious of that and use that. Again, these are neuro-linguistic um, programming type um, scientific things that work. And don't be afraid to add in oddball dates like Groundhog Day, Flag Day, Hamburger Day, National <laughs> Hot Dog Mobile Day. It doesn't matter. Make it fun. So make it make fun. Make it fun and make it a little different because you stand out then too because they're not expecting anything from anyone. So add to it. So you know how I talked at the beginning of this session about how we tend to, uh, please make me feel important, but we're afraid fear holds us back. Uh, it holds all of us back. Everybody from the President of the United States right down to everybody else. Um, we all, we're all human. We're all born. We are, nobody's better than the next person. We are all gonna live and we're all gonna die and we all have to eat to, go, um, to live. You know what I mean? We're, we're human beings. So with that said, we all have fears and concerns. And so how do we control those? And how do we control our thoughts? Through affirmations. Anybody practice affirmations on a daily basis out there? Just thought, just, just curious, anybody? Uh, Maggie, you do. Any of you new, new, newbies out there have any affirmations? You don't have to share them, you don't want to, but just wondering if you've heard of them or if you do them. You can control your thoughts and change and become more successful. It works, it works, it's wildly successful. And I know Maggie agrees with this. Um, so, you know, you've heard it said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, Henry Ford said, you're right. You, I believe you get what you give in life. There's, there's natural laws of nature or of life whether you believe them or not, and this is where I'm, I said in the beginning to hang those preconceived notions on that little um, you know, peg on the wall, because this is where many of you will say, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. And many of you might say, he's a whack. <laughs> so just listen to me, okay? Because <laughs> it's true. And I want you to take advantage of them and I want you to learn from them and thrive from them, or at least open any of you that don't agree to the idea that these might be correct. So these are natural laws out there. Um, we reap what we sow. If you're a biblical person, it's in the Bible. If you're not a biblical person, you don't have to be. Um, they're in meditation books. They're in, um, they're in transmendental uh, trans books. They're in all different types of books. Or if you're in none of those things, they're just laws of nature. So if you give out good, you get good in return. If you give out bad, you get bad in return. You reap what you sow in life. So whether you believe in it from a 
uh, uh, religious perspective or not, use the law of nature that's out there. Use the law of the universe that's out there. Um, the law of the universe, I don't care what you call it, what you want to call it um, at all. I'm not here to judge any of that stuff. I'm here to show you whatever your beliefs are, use these natural laws. Am I saying that correctly, Maggie? Am I saying that appropriately? Yeah. Uh, yes, and but if you're of a scientific mind, think of it as energy. There's negative energy and there's positive energy. And one thing we know about energy is ne energy never ceases to exist, ever. So if you put out negative energy, it just continues to go out negatively. But if you put out positive energy, you it it ripples out. So whether you're scientific or or spiritual by nature, either either foundation supports the idea that if you put out good, if you put out positive energy, that is what you will, it will return to you. I love the way you explain it. And every time I do this, this, this class and you, and you say what you say, I'm like, oh my God, I, you sound like my wife. Every time I, you elaborate on it, she would say the exact same thing. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Deborah mentioned the secret. Yeah, the secret comes up every time we talk about this. And if you look at the secret, a lot of the speakers and the secret are from the turn of the 19th century. Agmandino, Carnegie, um, great contemporaries who also believed in putting out good, doing good. There's no nothing new here. It's been repackaged to for culture, for societal preferences. But the ideas are sound and they've been around for a very, very long time and they preceded the people from the 19th century. They didn't invent them. They, they collected ideas and thoughts from good literature and good science and brought it forward and it continues to go. And that's an example of good energy continuing. So- You know, it's funny. It's, it's funny because um, I put on my, on my Facebook this morning, as a post and on my your stories, I put, if you are going to get anywhere in life, you have to read a lot of books. I quoted um, somebody by that. And there's a new younger person who's with one of our competitors who liked it and then inboxed me and, and said, um, hey, Mark, um, what books do you, would you um, consider? Can you give me some ideas? And he's newer to real estate with one of our competitors. And I've had my eye on this person as wanting to, um, wanting, wanting to recruit him. And so I put things out there. I, now you're really going to think I'm whacked. I put things out into the universe. And, and I've had my eye on him not very long. And he responded to this. And like I said, he inboxed me. What books do you recommend? Long story short, I've been doing this for about 10 days with him. And so I, I responded, Miracle Morning. It's a book that um, yesterday I had a Zoom about. If you haven't read the Miracle Morning, anybody heard of that book, Miracle Morning? I highly recommend it. Um, Hal, Hal, oh, I can't remember his last name, but just Google Miracle Morning. It's, it's quite a good book. It's an easy read and it will change you. It will change your mornings. Um, so I, I took a picture of it off um, Amazon and I texted it to him. He goes, thank you so much. I'm going to go out and buy it today. Well, I engaged him back and forth and he's coming in to see me next week. And he's getting these two books when he gets here and doesn't even know it with a little little signature from me, The Secret, because you just talked about it. And as a man, and as a man think it, two easy books to give you some great stuff. Um, so again, whether he comes and joins Howard Hanna Real Estate or not, I hope he does. And I'm building a relationship like you are building a relationship with your buyers and sellers and your clients and customers. Um, and if this helps him in life and he never joins us, I gave something to him that'll help this young man in his mid twenties start a new career. And it makes me feel good because someone helped me when I was 21 in a career. You give it out, you get it back in return. What you give out, you get back in return. Um, the law of reciprocation. If they help you, you help them in return. The law of service. The only way to get what I want to give is to give them what they want first. So to receive, you need to give. When you give without strings attached, you attract more. So you're not giving because I'm going to get something back. Just know it's the law of nature. It's the law of the universe. You will get something back, but that isn't why you do it. You do it because you want to give. You want to give good to begin with. Makes sense. 
there's no exclusions to the law of attraction. If you fear loss, you'll bring loss. Your dominant thought is what is what's important. Don't think about what you don't have. As I mentioned before, use positive music on the way to an appointment. Instead of saying, I don't want this, say, I do want that. It, you're, you attract the law of the universe. You attract what is ever your dominant thought. If you think I'm a loser, that's what you're attracting. That's what you're going to be. So say affirmations the other way around that you don't want to be a loser. Um, if you say, you know, I'm, I'll never get this listing. I'll never be a, a, a successful agent. Um, I want to do X amount of um, transactions this year. I'll never get there. You'll never get there. But if you return it in a positive way, um, if you fear loss, you will lose. If you're excited about winning and own it, you will win. Trust me. Anybody want to elaborate on that at all? Anybody have any thoughts on that at all? Anybody think I'm whacked? <laughs> Okay. Little things in life matter. They, I personally think they matter more than the big things. I truly do. And they make me feel good, um, the little things um, in life. Successful people do not let things slide. Little things are noticed and they're noticed. Um, this, I can't wait to give them these two books because I know it'll make them feel good. What does that do for me? Just makes me feel good. But I know what it'll do for him because he's anxious. If he hadn't said, for him to be proactively say, what books do you recommend? You know, here I am, you know, I'm, I run a, a large real estate company. So to him, I'm kind of a big deal. I'm not, I'm no better than him. I'm not saying that at all. But to him, I think he kind of looks up, you know, this guy's successful. He started when he was younger. I want to hear what he has to say. So me giving him this books will encourage him. And that makes me feel good. So do that for yourself as well. You know what I mean? Um, so ask yourself, is there anywhere I can give a little more? Am I making sense or do y'all think I'm nuts? Give me some feedback. Mark, can I just jump in? <laughs> yes. And say, I, you know, I love all of this stuff and uh, our words are free. Uh, so, so be very free with sincere compliments to people yes you know, don't, don't have it be forced but words are free and i think a lot of people forget uh to use them and it's so nice to hear somebody says you know just this morning you know maggie complimented me on my pearls that's going to take me through my day <laughs> so just remember that words are free and you know use them for good uh, and, and jen jen said something that was key uh, she said sincere you can't fake sincerity so don't do it if, if you don't mean it but if you do mean it it will come through somebody texted me the other day a, a really sweet text and i i was they didn't have to do and i responded back you made my day and they did um one other thing that i would encourage you to do i remember i'll never forget and i i hate saying these things because i don't want it, it, i don't want it to be about me but i would i'm going to say it because i want you guys to give you ideas. I remember the last time I was in New York City and we were um, in the village, my wife and I, and we stopped into a bakery and we, oh my God, the donuts were fantastic. And we each ordered a donut. And there was a, there was a homeless guy not too far away, um, about a, not quite a block away. And um, so I ordered an extra one of, of what Nancy had and what I had and, had and had it put in a bag. And I walked over to him and I handed it to him. And he looked at me and he opened it up and he took it out and he went, oh, and he gobbled it up and the smile on his face, it was like a Christmas present to a kid. It did way more for me than it did for him. You know, so just, and, 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 and when you do things like that, now I'm gonna sound like a hypocrite. When you do things like that, don't tell anybody. It, and I'm only telling you because I, I wanna encourage you to do things like that. Um, those kinds of things that I do, I keep to myself. I don't even tell my wife. Do things like that and you'll get a blessing in return, if you don't mind me using that word. Um, and it helps that person. Okay, let me continue. Use what talent you possess. The, um, it would be very silent if no birds sang. The, um, there to, you know, it, it, this is a great saying that, that Maggie put on and did for me and I, and I appreciate that. 
If you neglect to exercise any talent, power, or quality, it soon falls away. So if you continue to practice and give good listing presentations and good buying presentations, you can be so good, they're fantastic. But it's kind of like a language. If anybody ever used to speak Spanish or French or Italian, and you were so good at it, and then you didn't for a long, 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 long time, and you lose it, it's the same thing with your presentations. If you keep practicing, you get so good at it, and then if you stop, you lose a little bit. So continue. Yeah, can I just add to that, that a lot of times realtors who've been in the business for a long time, they start to let go of some of the things that they did when they were brand new in the business that made them successful in the first place. And honestly, when you go back to mid-level and higher level agents who are saying, boy, my business is stagnating and I can't seem to budget and I, I need some fresh ideas. What we train them on is what we're training you on to get back to the basics and do the basic beginning steps. They let go of them over time thinking, oh, I'm so good at this now. I can, I can miss, I, I don't have to do that anymore. And what they find out is that by dropping those things by degrees or entirely, they've impacted their careers negatively. So we always bring them back to the basics. So these are the foundation stones. This will always be where you come back to. What, and you're going to find each and every one of you will find that those stones are gonna be a little bit different for each of you because of your personalities because of the market that you work in, because of the clients that are attracted to you. So all of this attraction stuff works together. So your steps are not going to all be exactly the same. They're going to have their own unique um, pattern. And so what is that? Mark it down, write it down, keep track of it and make sure that you make it a repeatable process because that's how you become successful. And that's how you stay you know, successful and keep growing. That is, th those are words of wisdom. Those are so good. You're all right on. Before the, um, early this morning, before I, when I first came in the office, something popped into my mind that I used to use all the time. And I thought, oh my God, I haven't, I haven't practiced this in a long time. And I haven't used this in a class. And I thought to myself, you get out of a habit and you, you drop things. And there, and this will be pertinent for you all. They're the, they're the three circles. Um, that I used to put on a, on a whiteboard when I was teaching class in person, three circles. In the first circle, I would put P and it meant prospecting. And I would tell new agents, when you're brand new to real estate, you're in that first circle, you're prospecting, prospecting, prospecting. And then what happens when you prospect enough? The second circle is um, A, you get a bunch of appointments. So you're going on listing appointments and you're going on um, showing appointments. And then what happens when you get listings and you make sales? You go into that third circle, which is S for service. And you're servicing the listing and you're servicing the buyer to, um, to closing. And then when they're all done, you got to start all over again with prospecting. So I take those three circles and I intersect them. The agents, when they're brand new, which isn't for this class, but I figured I'm going to pop it in right now. Um, when you're brand new, you want to get into the habit, form good habits. And that habit is that you always want to put in your calendar um, prospecting activities, appointments, and service. Don't go from one to the other to the other and start all over. Be doing them all simultaneously. And, it, and it's something I used to, used to teach all the time. And, and Maggie, I, I stopped a couple of years ago and it popped into my head this morning. I wrote this down this morning. So you, I can't believe you just brought that up. But again, I believe it's because I was gonna do this class today and I was supposed to say this. And you understand that, don't you, Maggie? Exactly, it all works together. So cool. Oh, in this book, The Secret, for those of you that might've read it, that's where I get this from, ask, believe, receive. That's what they teach. So. I have my um, I have my goals about how many agents I want us to join our company that are new and and experienced. So I ask for it to the universe. I believe it and I receive it. And I have specific agents out there that are with other companies that I've asked universe for, and I get them. Okay, I know some of you think I'm whack now when I say that. That's okay. You're welcome to think that. I'm just saying that though. This stuff works. Okay. <laughs>
So Jen, I, do you think I'm whack now too, or do you believe me? <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a huge believer. I've been a huge believer for years. Um, uh, I can tell you visualization stories, um, from my son, who's now a lacrosse coach. I can tell visualization stories of agents who, you know, either had, um, uh, you know, photos of cars they've wanted to buy that they ended up purchasing cash. Um, I've had, you know, people, you know, visualization is huge for me and it's science-based and it's all, you know, your brain, we only use a portion of our brain. It can be trained uh, so that we use a little bit more than the average bear. And boy, oh boy, does it make a difference. I'm no, Mark, I've been a huge proponent of this message for years and years. And it doesn't took, surprise me. <laughs> it took me a long time to get here, uh, but it will affect every aspect of your life. And a, doesn't and surprise you, me. That's why I asked you. I, I had a feeling you were going to go. I had a feeling. I it, it just from knowing you, I had a feeling. That's great. And it's something um, that it's, uh, you know, feed your head with good stuff, feed your head with good books, feed your head with good movies, feed your head with great your music. dominant thoughts, your dominant thoughts. Absolutely. And, you know, speak to yourself well. Um, you know, your, your brain is an equal opportunity listener. So be very choosy about the words in your self speak. Uh, oh my god that's you know, huge don't, don't say i'm fat i need to lose weight say i enjoy being 20 pounds thinner uh, be very aware of the words you're saying to yourself because i i have seen people transform their lives because of all of this and I could go on and on for hours. <laughs> and when you're when you are doing self speak, it's very helpful to speak out loud because the way the brain works. When you say something internally, it stays on one side of your brain. When you say it out loud, it the other side of your brain actually hears you say it. So when I was a massage therapist for over ten years, uh, I had a lot of people who had trouble sleeping, which accounted for a great deal of their pain because lack of sleep affects the body, affects the mind. I would say, before you go to bed at night, give yourself permission to sleep. Say, I give myself permission to sleep. I'm going to put down all my worries of the day, allow my body to rest. So when I wake up in the morning, I am mentally and physically able to handle my problems or my issues or my day, whatever it was. Time after time after time, clients who would do that would come in and say, Maggie, I slept through the night for the first time in a decade in a year, in six months, in three months, whatever it was, and it started to transform their lives. So then they started to tell themselves other things. I believe I can get this job. I believe um, I'm going to be okay. I believe I'm gonna get through this situation. I believe my recovery after my surgery will, will be uh, uh, healthy. When people would have surgery and they come to me post-surgically, I'd say, okay, let's picture pink, healthy tissue with blood and oxygen flowing to the site. And there's, they would, their doctors would say, because I'd get the reports, that their recoveries were remarkable. Why? Because they were visualizing it in their body and they were transforming their cells because the brain actually has the ability to send out different hormones and change body chemistry. I, I'm a true believer in the power of the brain um, the power of the mind, the power of thought, and they're all interconnected. You can, uh, if you take Mark's wise words here, you, you, you can transform your life. And when you get down and you feel beat up by this business or just life in general, just stop that thinking and just say, I can get through this. I have the strength. I have the ability. I have the intelligence to get past this moment. And then go find something to do, you know, mop a floor, run around the block, play with a child, play with your dog, um, read a good book, listen to good music, whatever it is for you, and find that thing that's going to move you past that bad moment. But don't 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 allow yourself to stay there for very long. It's Have the affirmations and say the affirmations to get you through it, and practice one or two or three affirmations daily. I would I would encourage you to sit in your favorite chair or on your couch or your favorite place. 
every day for three to five minutes in silence alone and think about what you're grateful for. Um, those types of things. Um, as Maggie said, it can transform your life business-wise, personally, whatever. Put it out there. Um, Doris, did you say you bought your last car seven years ago? I did say that. So uh, I'm gonna, uh, um, we're almost done. Don't worry, I, I won't keep you too much longer, all of you. Um, but it reminds me of, um, I'm a creature of habit and I don't like to buy cars because I just get comfortable with a car. But then when they get to be about 100,000 miles, it's time for me to trade it in. And my last car, I just really, really, really liked. And I've had it seven years. And, um, and, it's, and, and I always buy the same car. It's, the, you know, it's a, a Lexus um, 350 ES, ES350. So the last five, six cars I've had. Because I'm a creature of habit with cars when it comes to it. And last um, year at this time, I was in North Carolina um, at the Biltmore Hotel. And they upgraded my, my rental to a, to an um, Jaguar SUV. And I'm not an SUV person. I just like my, my four-door sedans. But I've been wanting to get an SUV because you can put stuff in them and whatnot. So they upgraded me free to this ja a Jaguar um, black on black SUV. And I don't know what it was, but I drove from North Carolina to South Carolina to Georgia to Florida. It was a, for over the 10 days, I put 3000 miles on it, my wife and I. And I took to this car immediately. And I'm like, wow, I've got an SUV that I feel I can use. And I really wanted, I go, you know, I got to get rid of this car. I was going to get another, um, but I really like this one. So I came back to Syracuse last, last, you know, last year at this time. And um, there's no Jaguar dealer in Syracuse. The nearest one is Rochester. I'm like, I don't want to go to Rochester. And I want this exact same one. Hey, same color, Rochester's same everything. great. I, I know. I didn't mean that. I was born in, I was born in Rochester. I love Rochester. My brother and sister live in Rochester. I just wanted my close. I wanted my dealer close. And I know the, the owner of the, of the Lexus. Sorry, so I was more your chops. Go ahead. Tell your so, story. Um, so I put it out to the universe. Um, I, so I called the rental place because it was brand new. I was the first person to drive it. And I said, I want to buy this car. And I was, uh, I made a deal to buy it. Um, right. But it, COVID, COVID happened. And so that blew everything up. So for the last year, I've been saying to my wife, I want this Jaguar. I want the same year, 2019. And I want it black on black, the same everything. And they didn't have, um, I, I went online. I tried to hear an air. So I said, okay, universe, I want this. So then I look and I see that there's a Jaguar dealer in Rochester. I call them up. You know how when you go and they give you a loaner car? Mm -hmm. They had a brand new Jaguar F-Pace SUV Black on black, the exact same car I drove last year. Awesome. It was a good price because it was their loaner car with few miles. And what do you think I'm driving right now? That car. That's not by accident. And you no. understand that Jen and Maggie, right? If it was white or, or blue, I wouldn't have bought it. I wanted, they only had one and it was that exact same car. That's not by accident. Um, so I only tell you that because you can make these things happen. Okay. I believe in the secret. I'm with you. Oh, I'm talking to all of you. <laughs> but yes, I used you because you said seven years too with a car like mm -hmm. me. Um, so persistence. We did, a, um, I'll talk faster now because I'm, I don't want to run over with you guys. I'm sorry about that. Um, so um, uh, we did a study on my company years ago about all of our top, 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 top successful agents. And they um, all had different traits, all different ages, all different I personalities. They had one trait in common. It was persistence. Persistent people begin their success where others end in failure. Um, that was the only trait they had in common. So I would encourage you to continue to be, to make pers be persistent on things. I have a, a, a list of things I wanna do every day and it, I, don't I don't accomplish them all, but I push them to the next day and to the next day, I will accomplish every single one of them, but it might not be today. So don't forget about it, be persistent. That is key. Um, and I strongly feel that it's all about your attitude. I always say, have the right attitude. And most of all, be enthusiastic and passionate in all you do. It succeeds, it attracts, and it shows, it attracts, and it succeeds. I mean, how many of you out there see the glass as half full? How many of you see it as half empty? Or how many of you are just grateful for the damn glass? Um, <laughs> which reminds me of a, 
cartoon Wizard of Is. He said, well, what do you predict for the coming decade? And the, and the um, fortune teller said, I see corruption, decadence, immorality, perversion, wars, famine, pestilence and disease, vandalism, drugs, street gangs, terrorists, bad schools, potholes, toxic waste, acid rain, fraud, embezzlement, government waste. And the wizard said, well, what about the downside? It's all about your attitude. Um, so with that said, if you haven't taken the, the self-analysis of the communication style, I encourage you to take it, decide and find out whether you're a driver feeler, an analyst, a theorist, whatever you are. And then you decide you wanna work and adjust your behavior to all four or to two of them or to three of them or to one of them. But I hope um, you've got some, some value out of this session and wrote a couple things down that might help you to um, be more successful both personally and, and in your business life. So with that said. Well done, okay. Mark. Uh, I was worried I was going to go over, so I kind of sped it up a little bit in the end. I just um, wanted to share. Deborah said uh, she just watched. She's watched a video on YouTube, energy orbiting manifestation. It says the words "I am" are the most powerful words to use when manifesting. You know, I am successful. I am healthy. I am strong. I'm resilient. I'm persistent. I'm you know whatever those words are. <laughs> Make sure you're ending it with a positive word because if you're ending with a negative word, guess what? You are those two. So exactly. always, always end with the positive, always. Um, it's so much easier for us to look at the negative. If I give you each two pieces of paper and I say, take one piece of paper and write down everything good about yourself. Take the other piece of paper and write everything bad about yourself. Uh, we're on that second piece. We're usually saying, is there another side? Can I get another piece of paper? We can, we yeah. can, we can negative ourselves to death. You know, try to think about the good things and, maybe try to view yourself through someone else's eyes and how they actually see you because oftentimes the people who are around us find more good in us than we actually recognize. Give us Absolutely. self credit for. Who is the person who said the I am affirmation? Who was it? That's Deborah Kennedy. Deborah, Deborah Kennedy, thank you so much for adding that. That is so, so true, thank you. Okay, well again, I hope you got um, some some nuggets here that can help you and um, want to wish you well. And I look forward to meeting you at some point in person. So with that Absolutely, said, we're Mark. That. Hey, Mark, we're going to, um, Tim C just asked for your contact information. So we'll um, give everybody your email address. Cool. So absolutely. And now all of you that are on Howard Hanna have Howard Hanna email. It's just the name at howardhanna.com. So that's always yes. It's Mark. It's it's Mark Ray at howardhanna.com. My last name is only two letters. R E. It's Ray, like do re me. Oops. Mark Ray at howardhanna.com. I spelled it if wrong. If you go to Rome, Italy, it's like Smith in the phone book. There were, were a dime a dozen. Marker. Yep, that's not right. Yeah, you type, you type like I type. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've been correcting everything yeah. I wrote today. Oh Mark, thanks. It's always great. Okay, Thank everybody. You, Mark. Have a good day. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank See you, you Monday afternoon.